My parents ghosted me five years ago after my wedding and now reached out. What do I do? My husband, 30 male, used to be my boss. About nine years ago, I started working as his assistant. We spent about two and a half years ignoring our mutual attraction until we gave in. We then went to HR, who reassigned me, and the whole thing was strictly above board from the time we began dating. I got pregnant about a year later, and my husband and I decided to just get married. While we'd only really been dating for one and a half years, we knew each other completely, loved each other, lived together, and there was a baby on the way. We knew how it would look, but I had to leave the company anyway due to problems with my new boss, so we didn't anticipate this causing any issues, except with my parents. They, 62 male, 57 female, have always been overprotective, so I knew they wouldn't like me dating my boss, and I hadn't told them, but I had to tell them if I wanted them at my wedding. We decided to be mostly honest with them about how it was strictly professional until it wasn't, how the second it got unprofessional we went to HR, how he had never taken advantage of me, but now we wanted to get married and we wanted them there. We did not mention the baby because I felt that giving them that information in addition to the rest all at once would just break them. I was only about four months along when the wedding happened, so the bump was easily hidden by a flowy dress. The wedding itself went off without a hitch, and apart from my mother pulling me into the bathroom shortly before the ceremony to ask if I was sure about this, which I said I was, my parents seemed to take it well. The ceremony and reception were at two different venues, and we had to travel from one to the other, and my parents never arrived at the reception. I called them and got ignored, and then my brother called them and they told him that they were going home. I don't remember the exact reason they gave, but it amounted to them being tired and uncomfortable. I tried contacting them after the wedding, but found that I was blocked on everything except email, which I used to send them a long letter, essentially saying that I'm an adult who made an adult choice, and I hope they can respect that. Five years later, I have not heard from my parents since my wedding. My husband and I are not big on social media in general, but I recently posted something for our fifth anniversary in which I mentioned our two kids and third on the way. Within a month of making this post, my parents left a voicemail saying they saw the post and, having had no idea that they had grandchildren previously, now want to meet them. I haven't responded and there have been a few follow-ups since then asking why I haven't. I don't know what to do, but my gut instinct is that five years is too long and it's about the kids, not about them respecting my choices or relationship. However, I can't help but feel that I'm being unfair and my brother agrees because I told them in my email that if they could learn to respect my choice and my marriage eventually, then we could talk. And now I'm retroactively applying a time limit. Edit, can't find a way to work this in organically, but my husband is not white. I am, as are my parents. I don't think this is a race thing or that my parents are racist, and neither does my husband, and we don't understand why they would want to meet our mixed race children if they were racist, but this element is still gnawing at me. Should I reach out to them? If I did, how would we go about rebuilding the relationship? In the comments, how could you ever trust them not to just abandon your kids if they did something unauthorized? They've shown that they aren't willing to be loving. You can't trust people who don't know how to love. It's not even that they're not loving, but that their love is warped and conditional. It's based on whether OP's actions aligned with their worldview, something I'm sure OP was aware of as she lived with them for a number of years. OP knew on some level that her parents wouldn't be happy or approve of her relationship. There was a lot of pretense built around that. It's like a rug that can be pulled out from under you if they don't agree with what you are doing. That's not real love, that's control. You buried the lead in your comments here. The piece of the missing puzzle is being named for your older sister who died before you were born. It sounds like you were a replacement child and they dumped you because you were no longer doing what they wanted, especially with the added info of them talking a lot about your wedding day. They imagined your life a lot. It's honestly nothing to do with your husband being your boss in my opinion, and just to do with the fact that it's not what they imagined for you. The fact that they wanted to show up now they realized there is another little girl, apparently with the same name, is a bit of a red flag. You were put into an impossible situation, 
born to replace a person that only existed for a brief period. She always did as she was told. She always loved your parents first, etc, etc. What kind of parent ignores, no, literally ghosts their daughter out of the blue only to return once you've had grandkids? Would they still have reached out to you if they didn't know about your children? I hate to say this, but there are so many red flags through this thing. I'm quite concerned for the safety of your children as well, honestly. If you, your kids, and your husband have been living happily these past few years, please reconsider doing this. It's quite absurd these people would abandon you. You, not just a distant relative, but a family. A daughter? So quickly, especially over such a trivial matter. So put the safety, happiness, and sanity of yourself, your husband, and your kids first. No need to open a wound already stitched shut. You'll just be poisoning yourself. I know they are your parents, but I just can't see anything good out of their behavior, or anything that may come out of this. Edit, even if you feel regret, and you think they do too, please keep your kids far away from them. If they want to reconnect, it'll only have to be because they want to talk to you, not your impressionable children. No need to tell your kids about this also. I genuinely have a terrible feeling about this in particular. OP says, I feel the same. They talked non-stop about my wedding day when I was a kid, so the fact they just ghosted me on the day was so jarring. It didn't even feel real when it happened. And then when I went to call them to tell them I was pregnant, something else they had always eagerly anticipated, I was blocked on everything. Just because my husband used to be my boss. I don't think that they would hurt my husband or kids, but I'm concerned about them. I had an older sister who passed away when she was very young. I never met her, but I was named after her, and that caused all the issues you would expect growing up. So if there ever was a question of them meeting my kids, particularly my daughter, who was also named after my sister, I would need to know that they were safe to be around her. Why have they got such a hang up about him being your boss? It's not like he was 10 to 20 years older, he's literally a year older and your peer. Very odd. OP says, they think he might have taken advantage of me due to the boss secretary relationship we had, which makes no sense to me as if his only goal was to coerce me into sex, he wouldn't have married me. But they maintained for five years now that this is their only issue with my marriage. Do you think they'll regret not reaching out? I would think it's 100% up to them to rebuild their relationship with you and decide if it's enough. I don't know if you would trust them with your children. They walked away from their daughter so easily, I can see them doing that to the kids as well if things don't go their way and they're likely to be hurt. OP replies, I think there is potential for regret with both options. If I don't reach out to them, I'll always wonder what could have been. But if I do reach out, then they could be amazing, say and do all the right things, and my life will be better for it but they could also be terrible to my family and an all-round harmful presence in our lives. And like you said, they could walk away from the kids. And if the kids grow to love them before they walk away, it'll break their hearts to see them go. You can try to reconcile with them without involving your kids. If they can have a respectful relationship with you and the husband for a long period of time, a year at least, maybe they can meet their grandkids. How they respond to a reasonable boundary like that will show you whether they are willing to accept that they acted badly and earn back your trust. And now on to the update. So I asked to talk yesterday. We were on Zoom within an hour. It was my parents and me and my husband. They asked to see the kids and I said they could see them eventually, dependent on them earning our trust and convincing us they were going to be positive additions to the kids' lives. They asked to start by reading me a letter that they claimed to have written on my wedding day. It said that they were uncomfortable with me marrying my former boss as they thought that he took advantage of me. So they left between the wedding and the reception to avoid a scene, but they wanted me to know that they were here for me despite their issues with him. They added that they would have sent this to me the morning after my wedding, but then I sent my email about them needing to respect my choices, and they were so ashamed they couldn't bring themselves to send theirs. Seeing my anniversary post made me realize how much they've missed in five years, and they really don't want to miss any more. I had some questions, like what the big deal was with me marrying my former boss, and they said that it just wasn't what they had in mind for my wedding day and my future spouse. 
I asked why they even came to the wedding at all if they didn't support the marriage, and my dad responded that he wanted to walk his daughter down the aisle as it was the only chance that he would get. The way it was phrased implied that they had intentionally only come to the wedding so he could give me away, and always planned to leave halfway, and because he said my daughter and didn't talk to me directly, it was pretty clear that he was thinking about my older sister who passed away. My husband caught that too, and said that if they were talking about me, they should address me directly. Then added that if they planned to leave, they should have told us as we wouldn't have invited them. And the fact they waited five years to reach out was going to take more reasons than shame, as, as a father, he didn't understand how they could ignore their daughter for years or only get back in touch when we had kids. My dad snapped that he wasn't going to take this from a cushy, a slur meaning dark-skinned. My mother immediately tried to run damage control, but I ended the call. They have since messaged me several times, trying to explain that calling my husband a racial slur wasn't indicative of a racist attitude, and he wouldn't have said that in front of the kids, so they should still get to meet them. I've spent five years wondering how they were so offended by me marrying my boss that it earned no contact for half a decade. Turns out, they're just racist. It's almost nice to find out. If it wasn't just the boss thing, I would have sympathy for them, and we might even be able to reconcile. But with this, it's now just a question of if I'm going to knowingly expose my mixed race children to a couple of racists, which I am obviously not going to do. Now in the comments, if your parents said they wouldn't say that slur in front of your kids, then they know it is wrong and shouldn't have said it at all. You've done the right thing. Calling someone using a racial slur out of sudden anger most definitely means they have racist attitude. Sometimes we need to cut people out from our lives to protect who we are. This time you were doing that and protecting your family. They have shown who they are and cutting them out can mean cutting out that toxicity. Yes, forgiveness is something that we should all strive for, but sometimes we just don't need that negativity around us. Wish you the best. OP says, they're insisting they aren't racist, but even in our worst fights, my husband and I have never called each other slurs. And the only people who have ever called my husband slurs have been racist. What my husband was saying wasn't wrong either, or unfair. Half of it was things that I told him that I wanted to say to them, but I'd gotten too emotional to actually say it. I think I'm quite a forgiving person, but there is no forgiveness to be had here. On a call when he needed to be on his best behavior and your father couldn't hold back the racial slur? Wow. It's a shame for everyone involved that their attitude will negatively affect so many people, but it sounds like you really made the absolute best choice. It just had to be it. Nothing else made any sense. I was expecting him to be 50 and married when I read the title of the original post. I've never in my life heard of a parent being this freaked out that their kid basically met their partner at work. Mom, dad, don't freak out, but this person that's the same age as me is more successful than me. Hope that's okay. Is not a thing. Had to be a race or a cultural issue. OP says, I thought that it would be the boss thing because if I, 20 years from now, found out that my daughter was pregnant with her boss's child, I would not be happy but he wasn't my boss at the time. We were getting married, and I could never not talk to my daughter for five years. At least they've admitted, accidentally or not, that it was a race thing, so I know not to waste my time with them. Just in case I'm not the only one, the word cushy or cushy, C or K usage, is generally used in the Hebrew Bible to refer to a dark-skinned person of African descent. It's really odd when racism clashes with controlling grandparents' urges, but there you go. Honestly, don't know what they thought would happen here. I'm glad OP didn't subject her kids to those people. I am 99.9% .9 positive that they tell people that they can't be racist because they have mixed grandchildren, forgetting to say that they never met. This is it. As a biracial kid, my white family often uses my family as can't be racist because my dot dot dot, despite the grandparents having called my father slurs. I'll do one better. I'm multiracial. My grandma made me hide in the back when other white people came over. I wasn't allowed to sit on certain furniture or touch certain things that my white cousin could touch or sit on. 
The white side regularly called me a mongrel and even said in my grandma's will that the mongrel grandchildren only get X dollars. My sister had never been called that to her face, so she was shocked. She can pass, but I'm obviously black. I can go on for days or years longer. That's just off the top of my head. I lost control on a date in front of her whole family. What can I do now? I joined a website for dating to try and get more dates. This was my only intent. I've been working too much for two years at my new job. I just wanted to have more fun. I got an email and set up a date with this girl. It's my fifth date from the site and it's been fun. But this one girl was like one of those love at first sight moments when we met at a restaurant. I saw her and she was perfect. I tried to play it cool, but I felt like I could just cut ties with all the girls I've dated and just commit to her. Physically, she was everything that I could ever ask for and exactly my type. Her personality seemed about a 10 out of 10. About 30 minutes into sitting down, we didn't even order because we were just talking. The chemistry was as good as it was with my first love when I was 13. It was perfect. Sparks were flying. I thought I was done and ready to commit here. But then she tells me to forget about ordering food. Let's go somewhere else and she has this idea. She won't say much and I like surprises, so I didn't ask much. We jumped in my car and drove to this restaurant about 20 minutes away, kind of out of town. It was halfway up a mountain near a ski resort. I'm familiar with the area, so no big deal. We walk in and her family is celebrating her aunt's birthday. There was only family and a lot of it, about 40 people. She introduces me and everybody was happy to meet me and real nice. Everybody also knew that she was out on a first date. They were asking her stuff like, is this the guy? Is this your date? Is this the one? And all of a sudden, I wasn't so cool and relaxed. I felt heavy pressure to be on my best behavior. It was high pressure to the third degree, but everybody was nice, so that helped. We sat down and I started being questioned by her older sister, her aunt, and another lady that I forgot her relation to my date. The mum started kind of defending me and telling me to back off and let me eat, but the interrogating continued. After I don't know how long, they turned to my date and jokingly said, we approve. And then I was able to kind of get my bearings about me for a minute. I was totally off balance all night, just tense. I was afraid the back of my shirt would get that big wet spot because I felt sweat on my back. So the sister brings her cute little girl and lets me hold her, and she and my date started taking pictures of me holding her and somebody else's baby boy as well. I started to feel like the tone of it all was that we were a couple. I kind of felt like I was married to her and these nice people were my in-laws. After a couple of hours, probably closer to three, everybody was kind of tiring out and everything began to wind down. Keep in mind, her car is still at the other restaurant down a hill. Then her dad suddenly asks me jokingly what my intentions are with his daughter, though I can't remember how he phrased the question. Everybody looked at the table and looked at me, which is about half the people there. I guess I was exhausted from all the questioning. I was questioned by multiple people multiple times and the pressure of it all because I kind of lost it. He asked the question, I looked across the table at her and she told her dad to stop it. Her dad smiles and jokingly says that he'd really like to hear my response and her uncle, I think, also said that he'd like to know, jokingly. I looked at my date and said, can I talk to you alone for a minute? To which her dad laughs loudly and says, I made him nervous. So everybody is laughing now and I guess it was a big joke. Then I said to my date, hey, can I talk to you alone for a minute? I stood up in place, kind of. It was one of those long bench seats and I couldn't push it back because other people were sitting on it. And then her sister, I think, says, oh, there are no secrets in this family, speak your mind. People then laugh again and everybody starts making jokes about not having secrets and this man who married into the family somehow tells me that he remembers being in my place and he says, let me give you some advice. The best thing to do right now is to speak your mind and be honest. Then others join in and echo his sentiment, all jokingly I think. So I looked at my date and she says something like, you can tell me anything here, we're all family. 
She also, I think, was joking, but I had started to lose my ability to tell when people were joking and when they were serious. So the dad says, wait, I haven't gotten an answer to my question. So finally, I speak directly to the dad and said, I'd like to discuss that with her first. But I regretfully laughed as I said it. So her dad says, I asked you first, I wanna know. I turn to my date and she says something like, go ahead, you can tell me, I'm a big girl, I can handle it. So I said, okay, and sat down and then took a couple of breaths while her dad kind of quieted everybody down. I started with, I think I made a huge mistake. It all spiraled down from there. I said harsh things like that I felt like I was having a bad dream where I was suddenly married. I questioned her intentions in bringing me there. I said stuff like, what were you thinking? Yes, I liked you, but I just met you. And right now I know your aunt. I pointed at her sitting next to me better than I know you. I think she was humiliated, but I couldn't stop. The more I spoke, the more bad stuff came out. Total effing tailspin. I said I wanted to find someone special, but I don't want to skip the first 29 dates and skip to date 30, which is what I'd done that night. Then people started interrupting and chiming in and suggested that she and I slow down and have a real first date. I wasn't having it. I was out of control. I said, no, it's too late for that. I feel robbed here. I wanted to meet this girl, get to know her, date her, and maybe fall for her. But now it's like we're engaged and her whole family is here and there are all these expectations. We skipped the getting to know each other and dating part, so I feel robbed. Then I said yet another thing that I regret. I said, it's a huge red flag with an emphatic gesture that I asked for a minute alone with you to talk and this is what I got instead? I added something like, you're all great and a great family, but the lack of certain boundaries is a huge red flag for me. I would never let my relationship become family business. My date interrupts me at this point and says, okay, so let's talk in private. Let's go outside and talk. I'm sorry I didn't give you that minute. Let's go outside and talk privately. I'll give you all night. She was visibly shaken and I could tell tears were inevitable. I stood up again and, realizing that I had insulted all of them, I just quietly walked out. I felt really bad because they were all nice and had nothing but the best intentions for me. They love her, and they literally were telling me that I was good enough, which should have been a compliment. But I somehow took it the wrong way and spat in their face. I didn't even drink. Edit. Sorry, I proofread and changed some minor stuff. Also, I added some stuff to the statement below. We walked out and I let her have it again. She's now sobbing uncontrollably. She apologized and pretty much begged for us to start over, and I told her I wasn't into it and I left her there. I drove home and couldn't help but wonder if I overreacted. I couldn't sleep and I woke up this morning feeling like I probably did overreact and now I feel like crap, but it's done. I can't undo it. And let me ask this more clearly. Should I call her and apologize for humiliating her and insulting her family or should I just move on? Or should I wait and see if she calls and apologize then? In the comments, I'm sorry, I usually try to give serious advice, but this is hilarious. I think one day very soon you'll be able to look back on this and laugh. To put it in perspective, you thought you had a good thing going for about an hour and then she royally screwed up. Brush yourself off. It was nothing, just an hour of good chemistry. The girl for you will be able to make you feel that good for longer than that. This was my reaction too. This is comedic gold right here. No matter how bad of a date this was, it'll make a hell of a story to tell later on. Oh man, I wouldn't say this was your fault in the slightest. You were on the first date from hell. No one in their right mind has their date meet their entire family on the first date. And you just reacted as you would be expected to meet their interrogations all night long. On top of that, her family sounds like they would be extremely hard to deal with in the future even if this does work out somehow. They were prodding and judging you the second you walked in, so you shouldn't think that it was such a big compliment for them to accept you. They were basically seeing if you were right to marry her daughter, which is insane for a first date. Honestly, I don't know if you should ever want to see her again if this is how her family is, and if this is how she thinks first dates should go. 
It sounds like she had planned for you to meet everyone, especially because they kept saying, is this the one you told us about? Showing that she had talked you up a lot, even before you'd seen each other. Admittedly, you probably shouldn't have voiced any of your concerns at the table, and instead, just went outside and waited for her to join you, or even left as that was a volatile situation. But the rest of your actions sound very reasonable to me. I'm surprised you kept at it for as long as you did. And edit, rereading the first part, I'm even more convinced that she wanted you to meet her family the entire time, which is the biggest red flag of this entire post. She wanted you guys to leave the restaurant you met at and proceeded to go straight to where her family was. This was her idea the whole time. OP says, I don't think that she planned for me to meet her family. I think that was just spontaneous. She told them about me because it sounds like she told them about my profile and our emails and texts and stuff. I also forgot to mention that she doesn't have a profile. Her friend or relative has one and they were browsing together when they messaged me from that person's profile. So I agreed to a blind date, but she had seen my pictures. I don't know how this is relevant, but that's what happened. I have to agree with the other guy that it does sound like she planned on introducing her to her family the whole time. If the family is that close, then it seems odd to me that she would schedule a first date on the same day as her aunt's birthday party and presumably miss most of the parties staying at the original restaurant you were at. I think you did the best you could in that situation, which is incredibly odd. Taking someone to meet the entire family and having the family grill them on date one is a red flag. Oh man, this was kind of hilarious. I felt like I was reading someone's nightmare fuel. Don't do it. If you do, it might give her the idea that you still might be interested. Even if you are interested, I suggest you don't move forward with this relationship. Yes, I am sure she did not expect the whole family to turn into many inspectors, but damn, she should have known better. You were right. That's like the 30th date type situation. But this whole date was a huge red flag, as I also make an emphatic gesture. OP says, I rarely use the word huge, but when I do, this emphatic gesture just comes out. Sometimes people laugh, sometimes they make fun of it, but yes, it was ugly and my emphatic gesture didn't help. If you owe her an apology, then she owes you one right back. She put you in a really screwed up situation after less than an hour of knowing you. Did you react a little overboard? Yes, but it was warranted, and I don't really think that anything you said to her or her family was necessarily out of line. They told you to be honest, and you gave them exactly what they asked for. It's not like you called them names or wished them ill. I say move on. If she contacts you, then apologize, but if she doesn't, move on. OP replies, they did ask for it. I would almost say they begged for it. They really thought that in speaking my mind, I would say, I love her, I want to marry her. And now on to the update. I just want to clear something up. My date never had a profile on the dating site. She was browsing through with her friend who has a profile and they were looking for a date for her friend. It was the friend who originally messaged me to set me up with my date. Also, I deleted my profile. I'm totally done with online dating. I've been in this city two years now, so I'm just gonna go out and meet people the old fashioned way. It just feels less risky somehow. I know this is gonna disappoint many of you, but I decided to speak with her. The very day I posted here was the day immediately after our date. That same evening, she called me, but I didn't answer because I was in the shower, so she sent me a text that said, do you hate me too much to talk to me? And I texted back, I don't hate you. She responded, can I call you? And I texted, yes. So she called and immediately went into full apology damage control mode. I told her that it was okay, that I was already over it and I had moved on. She asked if there was any way that we could meet because there were some things that she wanted to say in person and she wanted for us to part with a handshake and all of that. It kind of sounded like she needed closure. So, I agreed to meet her downtown to talk the following Tuesday. Not a date, no lunch, no coffee, we just met at a park. We met and I knew she was still the one. She told me she loves me and we decided to try it again. We went on three dates and I proposed and she said yes. We're gonna get married in December. No big wedding, we're gonna fly to Las Vegas and do it there. 
The plan is to spend Christmas as a married couple. Just kidding, I'm not that freaking crazy. Hope you're still reading. The rest of the update continues on the next paragraph. We met at a park just to talk. I had been so disappointed because I felt that the spark and the butterflies in the stomach would be gone. That I wouldn't like her anymore. As soon as I saw her, this was confirmed. There was no spark. She looked great, but I just didn't feel it. It kind of crushed me. So I decided to listen to her as she apologized again and told me she had really liked me on that first date and got carried away and made a very dumb decision that she wishes she could take back. She added that her mom had pulled her aside when we arrived and right from the beginning told her that if she liked me, she would just made a big mistake by bringing me. I guess her mom pretty much cringed when she saw us walk in that night. Also, I should say that her mom was the only one defending me that night and practically pulling people off me like her religious uncle who asked me if I'd been saved. I remembered that pretty well, but I guess her mom came down on her hard for not just having a first date. But she also said that things got even crazier after I left. Her mom wasn't there for my rent. She had driven somebody home and came back after I left. She found my date outside crying and was told what happened. Her mom, I guess, stormed into the restaurant and went off on everybody for ganging up on me. My date says she called them a bunch of out of control animals. The whole thing was reduced to a big finger pointing fest by everybody. The mom was furious because the story is that my date's dad left them when my date was nine. He had some sort of breakdown and became an alcoholic. He became verbally and emotionally abusive, so the mum kicked him out to protect the kids. He refused to get his act together and disappeared for almost 10 years. So the mum hates when the dad acts like he has a say in his kids' lives since he was gone and just came back less than two years ago. But he still lives over an hour away. A lot of the people that were there, I guess, live far away and they flew in for the aunt's birthday. Supposedly, most of them she only sees once a year at most. So the mum went off on him especially hard and questioned his right to have any say in his daughter's decision to date anybody. She embarrassed him in front of everybody for having overstepped so many boundaries. So she told me this stuff cause she wanted me to know that she was very sorry that she let her dad act all fatherly when it wasn't the time and it wasn't his place. These were her words, not mine. In a way, I'm glad the mom wasn't there to witness me going off, cause then I would have felt really bad. But come to think of it, she probably would have stepped in and prevented it. She asked me if there was a way that we could have that first date again, but I said no. There is no way that I can pretend that we're meeting for the first time after all of that. I know too much about her. I feel way too gone past that first date mode right now, and maybe I need to take a break from formal dates. I did apologize to her for not telling her right away how uncomfortable I was and for going off on her outside the restaurant. I told her that there were a lot of nice people there that I felt bad about, but that I'm sure they understand me because they seemed reasonable. As I was talking to her, I could see how much better she felt that I had given my own apology. Her face went from subdued and sorry to kind of hopeful and semi-happy. She started to get back her glow and her spunk. We started talking about other stuff, what I do at work, my hobbies, and some other casual stuff. The more I talked, the more she glowed. I felt bad cause she showed up looking kind of fragile and contrite. She looked vulnerable, but by the end of our conversation, she was smiling and looked more sure of herself. I tried to show my sense of humor and made her laugh. I felt kind of sorry for her. I made it my goal to send her home smiling. I kind of started to feel that spark again after she started smiling and laughing more. She has a great laugh. It's really cute and innocent. It felt a lot like it did at the restaurant. Her awesomeness comes back when she's comfortable. She definitely does it for me. I walked her to her car and we agreed that another date is probably not a good idea right now. She wanted to meet my yoga teacher cause she's the best. My date, I feel weird not tying her name, has said that she needs to learn to relax more when she's stressed out. So I met her at yoga class the following Thursday on the 7th and made the introduction. My date has been coming to the same three yoga sessions that I do weekly. We talk there. She still flirts with me and hints that we should meet for hot tea as neither of us is a coffee drinker. I walk her to her car after class because it's dark by then. 
I still like her and I can tell she feels the same way. The spark is all the way back now. But all those comments I got here on my original post about her being crazy are still completely lodged in my head. They have me second guessing myself about staying in touch with her. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but whatever it is, is gonna take time. In the comments, she made a mistake. Sometimes Reddit is a vicious and cutthroat place. Follow your best judgment. If you wanna give her another chance, do it. You should always be careful about taking advice from people on the internet. They have nothing invested in your life. Most of the people giving advice here are cynical. He's not right for you. Phew, you dodged a bullet. Leave and don't turn back. I remember the original thread. Everyone bashed on the date and didn't bother telling the OP to listen to her side of the story. Forgiveness. How can one be a person who gives sound relationship advice and not give a chance for forgiveness? I think that was mostly because it wasn't a should I give her a second chance kind of post. It was more a am I a dick kind of post. People were going off on the date because OP needed to hear that his reaction was totally understandable and that what his date did was grade A crazy. Based on this update, I do think a second chance might be in order, but I do stick by most of my comments in that first thread. The only things that I feel are no longer relevant were the comments that the date had planned to take OP to this dinner from the start because none of us knew that it wasn't the real birthday party, but a follow-up event. We all thought that this was her aunt's actual birthday party. There are tons of varying opinions here. I think it's time for you to get off Reddit, put everyone else's advice out of your mind, and do what you really think. OP says, Well, I did post my experience here and ask for help. I sort of felt like I should post an update for a lot of people that were nice enough to take the time to drop me a line. I really wanted to let them know what's happened since my original post. But you're right. I have to do what I really think is right for me. And this is the reality of those Hollywood zany rom-com where the guy randomly meets the quirky family of his date who immediately loves him and gives him a playful ribbing and then the couple grows closer with some pithy comments about being hit on by an aunt and finding the family he never had. Forced familial bonding strangers in the course of less than a few hours is terrible, even as a person who loves meeting family. Jesus. That first date is nightmare fuel for me. I went on a second date with a guy who seemed totally normal. He said that he couldn't get a sitter for his toddler and asked if I'd come over for a movie after the kid went to bed. I got there, late, to make sure the kid was asleep and found out that he lived with family. They kept the toddler up past his bedtime to meet me. I met mum, dad, two brothers, a sister and a cousin. They kept cycling through the kitchen to peek into the living room and stare at me like a zoo animal. There was no third date. In fact, I quit dating apps for quite a while after that. It's a pretty big ask to invite someone to your house on a second date. Personally, I wouldn't do it unless I was already good friends with them. I don't wanna have my organs stolen. I spent most of a day with my friend and his other friend. Friend of friends seemed nice and normal, so I accepted when he asked me for a date. Our first date was supposed to be a restaurant, but somehow we wound up at someone's house to help them move. It was furniture and dirty car parts. If I wasn't wearing brand new white shoes and a silk blouse, I would have helped without being asked. Instead, I said that we should just do this another time and would have my friend pick me up. So his mother and father start calling me a princess and such, which leads the guy to start screaming at them to shut the F up, which leads to everyone screaming. I snuck out and started walking home, and I didn't even know where I was. To this day, I'm not even sure if they were actually helping someone move or if they were robbing someone. Am I the asshole for kicking my mom's boyfriend and his kids from the house that I inherited after my mom's death? They went to the homeless shelter. So my, 19 male, parents divorced when I was six. My mum got a boyfriend, Josh, and they started living together when I was nine. He had twin daughters who were four when they moved in. Their mother was not in their lives anymore. My mum took them in as her own. I admit that I was a little jealous because they had her full time and me only 50% of the time. I think my mum loved them more too. I was a quiet kid and spent most of my time in my room when my mum had me. I didn't want any siblings. My mum tried, but to no avail. 
By the time I was 16, I rarely spent time at my mom's place. And when I went to college, I got an apartment, even though my mom lived in the same city as my college. Mom tragically passed in December. Because Josh and her never got married for some reason, I inherited everything, including her house. I allowed Josh and the kids to still live there. I paid half of the bills as he is struggling because of a low paying job. My lease ends in December and I decided to move into my house after. I sat down with Josh and told him that I was moving in January. Since this is my house, I will take the bedroom and he will move to my old room. He started crying about how his bedroom is his safe space and all my mum's things are there which gives him peace. I told him that he can move a few of her things to my old room. My room is one third the size of the bedroom. He started crying even more that he doesn't want to abandon their bedroom. I was pretty pissed at that moment, so I told him to just get out of the house then as I don't have the energy to deal with this crap. I have since cooled down, but three days later he sent me a message to notify me where he left the keys and that they moved out. I found out that they went to the homeless shelter. I then got messages from my mum's side of the family about how I'm heartless and am cruel to kick them out. How the twins lost a mum and a home in less than a year. The twins texted me how they can't believe their own brother made them homeless and asked me what they did wrong. My dad and his family told me that I did nothing wrong. I do feel bad for them, but I still think I decide who gets what room in my house. Am I the asshole? Edit, I will call Josh today and ask him to meet. I'll try to sort things through and I hope we'll come to an agreement. Thank you everyone for your opinions and suggestions. In the comments, not the asshole. It's not a great situation for anyone, but he's been freeloading off of OP, guilting a 19 year old into financially supporting him, not only paying half their bills, but paying to live elsewhere so Josh could have the house. You are entitled to live in your own house, and you're especially entitled to the master bedroom. Josh tried to guilt trip OP and bailed when that failed. Him bailing to a shelter is all a part of the guilt trip too. He didn't need to leave right away. OP is not moving until January. That was all for show to get the family on his side and push on OP so he can get his way. This man is unhinged and not even attempting to be a father to his two daughters. Seriously this, I get grieving, I get falling into a deep depression, but when you're the parent, the only parent, and you're responsible for making sure your two daughters, who just lost their mother, are cared for physically and emotionally, you have to grieve differently, because it's not just about you. Not the asshole. You didn't kick them out, you asked dad to move bedrooms. He's the one who went nuclear and blew up his daughter's lives more than they already were. Your mom and he are the asshole for not making sure the house went to him. Does he work? Is he disabled? Can he not provide for himself and his children? Not dad, stepdad. Not the asshole. Not your fault they went to the homeless shelter and your initial offer was very reasonable. Legally, the house is yours. Situationally though, you've put two 14 year old girls and their dad in a homeless shelter. You've lost your mom. They saw her as their mother, so they have lost their mom too. Josh lost his partner and is obviously also struggling with grief. I'm not saying you're not entitled to the home you've inherited. People are correct in saying they should have planned better. They quite possibly thought they were too young to worry about death. You've also been helping out financially when you didn't have to. They were likewise not entitled to that help continuing forever, especially if it causes you financial hardship. Josh sucks for what exactly? Being in a low paid job? Not wanting to leave the bedroom he shared with his late partner? No, I can't call him the asshole for those things, sorry. I can't even call him an asshole for accepting your help if you gave it willingly. What do you suck for? You don't suck for helping out financially, you don't suck for wanting to move back in. You do suck for wanting to oust him from the bedroom that he and your mum spent their nights together. You do suck for spitefully telling him to get out rather than giving him time to work out options. Your actions have adversely affected two girls that did not do anything to deserve it. They are now at increased risk of sexual assault, robbery, and will have the trauma following them forever. Let alone what being in a shelter does to your education and work opportunities in the future. So yes, you do suck for that. You forced them out due to a moment of hot headedness, not out of any reasoned argument or need, but because you got spiteful and angry. You let your resentment towards your mum moving on get to you. 
and whatever it is your dad may have whispered in your head. Lashing out due to anger is what abusive people do, so you should watch out for that in case you have a tendency to react that way in other things. In this case, it may be a one-off due to grief. The danger is if it becomes a habit. You know your dad is only on your side because he had beef with your mum, right? The fact your mum's side is disgusted with you should have been a clue. So yes, you're the asshole. We found Josh's account. And now, on to the update. I want to say thank you for all the advice and support you've given me. I even appreciate the ones that didn't agree with me, as it gave me another point of view that I didn't think of. A lot has happened since my first post. We had our first mediation meeting about lawsuits, and we reached an agreement. I will have to pay one quarter of the savings my mom left me, which is a lot less than I thought. I met with Josh a day after my post. It went... unexpected. I apologized for my hot-headed response. I told him I didn't really mean it and invited him back home. He told me no. He admitted that it was actually very hard for him to live there. He saw my mom everywhere he looked and it was very hard for him. He took my kicking them out as an opportunity to leave the house without his daughters resenting him. He basically made me a bad man. He apologized for that. He didn't know his daughters called my grandparents and me, and when he found out, he confessed to his daughters and to my grandparents what he told me. I don't care either way about my grandparents, as we have no relationship. How he found out? My dad talked to him before. My dad wanted to help him, so he called him. He even got Josh 10 free sessions with his good friend, who is a grief therapist, and it's my dad that convinced him to talk to me. My dad is my hero, and in this case, the real master of puppets, lol. Josh will move in temporarily to my grandparents. I talk to my dad about the money. I decided to give Josh the rest of my mom's savings. He can buy a nice apartment and still have some left over. Josh was very happy and thanked me over and over again. I did it for the peace of mind. We probably won't have much of a relationship moving forward. For me, this is a chapter of my life that is closed. I will probably sell the house after my graduation from college. It has no sentimental meaning to me. That's it. I hope there will be no need for any more updates. And now in the comments... Wait, wait, what about a lawsuit? Depending on where they live, Josh might have been able to sue OP for an illegal eviction, or at least initiate the process to sue, I'm guessing. No. Despite the argument, he still left voluntarily. Illegal eviction would be like changing the locks while they're out. It took me a while to find the comment in the original post. His mum caused an accident, and as a result, someone was disabled. Shouldn't the insurance have covered that? There is a limit to insurance coverage. If they were sued for more than their insurance coverage, they have to pay out of pocket. Well, this is why you always make sure to get more than state minimums and have enough to actually cover an accident. Don't need to go insane, but yeah. So Josh's grift worked then if you gave him the savings? Josh wasn't trying to get money. He just didn't want to live in the house anymore because it had so many memories to the mum. Either way, Josh made his mum happy for years, so honestly, he does deserve something. But these situations need to be a lesson to others to get married and stop playing house. This is a great reminder of the importance of having a will. If your property is anything more complicated, then I have only one person in my life and they are legally related to me. Or just get married. Even if you just step in and out of the courthouse without any celebration and guests. An elder couple, friends of us, have been together for like 50 years now. They never married. They just started dating, started their careers, started living together and so on until 2010-ish. He got lung cancer, and it was a very close call. At a point, his... girlfriend? It sounds like the wrong word, was by his side waiting for his death. At the same time, his bio-relatives were basically camping by the house waiting for him to die so they could kick the partner out and inherit everything. Well, surprise surprise, dude lived, and still lives. After that stunt, he went no contact with all his family, but they still haven't gotten married. Although a couple of years later, laws changed so that those partnerships are recognized. So that's fine-ish for now. Unexposed is titled, How do I tell my mom I slept with her boyfriend before they met? 
I, 23 female, have been encouraging my mum, 40 female, to date for a while. She has been a single mum most of my life, and it seemed her only priority was her children. My mum deserves love just like any other person. She's put us first for so long that it was time to put herself first for once. Well, she met a guy after some encouragement from me, and I was happy for her. But recently, she introduced me to her new boyfriend, 49 male, and I instantly recognized the guy because we slept together a few times last year. I kept my cool in front of everyone, but internally, I was freaking the F out. I know he knows as well since he came up to me when we had a second alone and asked me not to tell my mum. I don't think I can do that. I want to tell her, but I don't want to hurt my mum. I really don't want her and him getting super serious, or worse, him becoming future stepdad or something. How do I tell her without breaking her heart or her hating me? In the comments, better to tell her now rather than the day before their wedding. She needs to know to decide to stay or leave. It's not right for anyone to keep this from her, especially not her daughter. Agreed. The new boyfriend is going into this relationship with OP's mother with a lie, a lie of omission. It's a serious one as well. It's not something minor or personal that can be omitted and ignored. It's actually one that may matter. I wouldn't date a woman's sister, cousin, friend, or anyone else close to them after we finished. I would definitely not go after the mother or even think of going in that direction ever. I can't even believe in his age group he dated someone half his age and now he's trying to marry the mother. This is disturbing. She cannot hide this from her mother. It's going to come out eventually and it's not going to be good later on. The quicker the better. Delaying things makes them a lot worse in the end and it's already bad. She deserves to know so she can decide if she wants to be in a relationship with someone who slept with her child. She also deserves to know that he approached OP and asked her to lie to her mother for him. This. Don't for a second hesitate. Your loyalty is with your mum, not with this guy. Quote, asked me not to tell my mum. You aren't hurting her, you're protecting her from a man who lied about that. Yes, she should date, but she shouldn't date him. Whether or not anyone thinks the age gap is bad, which it could be, but also I think you can still have a totally consensual thing like that, he's attempting to keep it from her, and that's bad. OP says, I agree. I just don't know how to tell her. It's all very awkward and will probably hurt her a lot. I think this is a band-aid rip-off kind of situation. Sit her down and tell her you have to tell her something awkward. Then just tell her, like you wrote in your post. And OP says, yeah, it's feeling more and more like a band-aid situation. Back up to the post, we have an edit. Thanks for the advice to the people who gave it. I'm currently writing a letter that I'm planning on giving to my mum. I think that's a good solution. That way I can say what I want to say without stumbling or saying the wrong thing in the moment. As for people judging what two consenting adults do and infantilizing women, F off. And the people who are just commenting about porn and other vile crap should F off too. This sub is supposed to be a place to get and give advice, not a debate club about morals. And now onto the update. So when I made my post and got some advice, I decided to write a letter so I could get my thoughts and feelings out properly. I won't put it here because it is very personal and emotional. Anyway, I gave my mum the letter that night. I stayed in the room with her as she read it. I had tears welling up as she was reading, thinking she would hate me after it. After she read it, I started crying and she started crying. It was all very emotional, but my mum assured me that she would never hate me and she was glad that I wrote the letter and I think we just hugged for a solid few minutes just crying into each other. We calmed down a bit after that and just spent the rest of the night watching movies and eating junk food. The morning after that, my mum ended things with her boyfriend. There was a bit of drama there with him calling me a sla la la and my mum screaming at him for calling me that. But after that, we haven't heard from him since and have been drama free. Me and my mum seem a lot closer now and I feel like I can be more honest with her without fear of judgement and of losing her love. Thanks to the people who actually gave advice and didn't make disgusting comments. Your advice was very helpful and got me to pull my head out of my ass and tell her ASAP. In the comments, I'm so glad that it turned out this well but please encourage your mum not to give up on finding love. Somewhere out there is a partner who deserves her. OP says, I will. She still deserves love from a partner. 
I hope she finds him soon and he's as wonderful as her. Sounds like you were banging a bunch of men out there if your mom happens to meet him and get romantic. Did the dude live in the same trailer park? Call Jerry Springer, lol. OP says, anything wrong with sleeping with a bunch of men? Or is it only gross when women sleep around? Not me, but my mom and her BFF were both widowed within months of each other. Her BFF was 10 years younger than my mom and had been about to divorce her husband when he had a heart attack. They were already separated, so she was soon back on the dating scene. She got serious with this younger man and brought him round to meet my mom. A moment of great hilarity ensued when they recognized each other. Her BFF's new boyfriend was my sister's ex. I'm always amazed by these posts, and there have been several variations of them. In cities of tens or hundreds of thousands of people, countries of millions of people, how? How does this happen? The odds are crazy. Life is funny. One night when I was in college in Chicago, I met a girl out at a bar. After some pretty substantial drinking, she invited me to go back with her to her place. After a 30 minute train ride, I was surprised to find that she lived in the exact same building as my ex-girlfriend, who I had broken up with a few months earlier. My surprise slash drunken confusion only increased when she led me into my ex-girlfriend's actual apartment, which still contained all of my ex's furniture and belongings. In my drunken stupor, I initially was worried that I was having some sort of hallucination, but I soon discovered that this girl was subletting the apartment from my ex, who had left a week or so prior to study abroad for a semester. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for abandoning my parents and risking them losing the house? When I was in college, I fell in with the wrong people, became a bit of an alcoholic and got pregnant. I had to drop out of college. My daughter's father was also a college student. I ended up going back to school and finishing up my degree. The issue was that her father got a very lucrative career path in his home state when she was two. He didn't want to move if it meant that he could lose custody, and my parents were only willing to fund my education in this particular college. We decided that, all things considered, the best thing for our child was that she be with her dad and his very supportive family. I regret that decision every day, but it was the best thing for my child. I have completed community college and have been working for a year and a half. I have been paying for everything. My parents are eyeballs deep in consumer debt, and all of their income goes to servicing it and adding to it while I pay for everything else. It is frustrating as I don't make enough to keep them happy. I wanted to move out, but I was not able to land anything worthwhile. I have been able to get a pretty decent remote role. My brother ended up moving to my ex's state. He asked me if I wanted to move in with them. I jumped on the opportunity. I lied to my parents that I was just visiting him and I flew out. I have been staying with him ever since. My parents are incredibly angry. They have accused me of abandoning them. They think they will lose the house. They want me to still help them and move back. I feel like an asshole because they have helped me. They took me in when I was someone on the edge of alcoholism, and now I'm sober and a productive member of society. It could have been so much worse without their help, and I was pretty underhanded about it too. In the comments, not the asshole. Your parents made the choices that put themselves in debt. You don't owe it to them to financially support them for the rest of their lives and lose out on being in your son's life in the process. This. They are making bad decisions anyway. If they paid their mortgage, electric, and bought food, they will make it. Paying for unsecured consumer debt while letting the house get foreclosed is insane. Quote, I don't make enough to keep them happy. The kid's story is very sad, but this is the sentence that really struck me. That's not your job. Did your parents suffer some crazy financial reversal between the part where you stayed at this college because your parents would fund it and the other part where you support them? This is a sad story, but you are not the asshole. I hope you still have a connection with your kids. Not the asshole. OP, as a parent, let me tell you what your parents should have said. I'm so proud of you. You worked hard to overcome your alcoholism. You worked hard to heal yourself. You deserve to keep moving forward. I would give every last penny, every one of my organs, the very last drop of blood and life in my body if it meant that my children could be happy, healthy, and strong. The child is not responsible for the parent, the parent is responsible for the child. 
go out, be your best self, and continue to grow in your health. I'm so sorry that you had to escape the way you did, but I am so glad you are free now to pursue better things for yourself and your own child. And now, on to the update. So it has been two months since I posted, and a lot has happened. The comment has helped me a lot. I was dealing with a lot of guilt about leaving my parents, and people helped me feel less like a horrible daughter. I have moved out and got a place of my own. It's only half an hour's drive from my ex's home. I get to see my daughter every week. I go over to his place every other day. I missed her so much. Just being able to play with her tells me that I made the right decision. My parents have tried to contact me and guilt me. I did send them rent for a month, but I cut them off. The only reason I have savings is because I hid money from them. I couldn't say no to them. It was horrible. They are planning on selling the house and buying a smaller one. They will have no savings left for retirement. My sister, who I have a really strange relationship with, called me and tried to tell me that I should at least help them out after they paid for my college. She had a specific figure which was way more than they spend. I told her that they didn't pay that much for my education. She didn't believe me, but I sent her the receipts. So they had asked her for money, and she had given them the money. They had told her that they needed money because they were paying for my tuition. They just inflated how much they were paying on my behalf. It is a lot. I know she hates me, and we were played off against each other growing up. I can't describe how emotional it made me to realize she still cared enough about me to help my parents. I know for a fact that she wouldn't have given them any money if they weren't helping me. It's a lot to work through. Things are pretty messed up right now, but I have a place of my own. I can see my daughter, I have a great job, and I'm sober. Now in the comments. So to be perfectly clear, your parents didn't pay for your college to begin with. Your sister did. Exactly. They are manipulative as hell. I hope OP tries to improve her relationship with her sister after this. Came here to suggest this. OP, you and your sister have both been lied to and manipulated by your parents. Maybe spend your energy working on your relationship with her, and you two can help each other separate from your parents. All of a sudden, downsizing the house is not a problem, as opposed to the last few years, which it's been a big problem. They can't save for retirement, they're probably squeezing it out of someone else now, see sister, because they didn't follow through with their options for years and tried to delay the inevitable and leech it out of OP. Kids are supposed to leave home and start their own lives. Your parents shouldn't depend on your income. Best of luck, OP. And also, OP, it's not your fault your parents lied to your sister and took money from her claiming to pay for your education. They decided to lie about paying for your education and needing money. They took advantage of you and your sister. What they did was horrible, but it was their choice, not the asshole. I'd say OP has a greater responsibility to her daughter than to her parents. Agreed. Her parents are adults and should be able to take care of themselves, especially since they're all still of working age. OP's daughter needs her mother in her life, not in another state financially supporting her irresponsible grandparents. The fact that they were lying to OP's sister about how much they were paying for OP's college proves that they have malicious intentions, likely planning to live off of their children while doing nothing to support themselves. Also, these people were still adding to their consumer debt while working and leeching off their kids. Something is super sketchy about this. OP needs to check her credit. I wouldn't be shocked if the way these parents paid her tuition was by taking out a student loan under her name. Key element of the story, consumer debt. Parents have credit cards and can't afford to live. They should have declared bankruptcy yesterday. My parents were like this. It was a constant 10 year cycle. Run up debt, declare bankruptcy. They even refinanced their house in their 80s with some predatory lender. When they died, we just let it all go to foreclosure and let the debt collectors fight it out. Some people never learn financial responsibility. I told my husband that we should get a divorce so he can marry his late wife's tombstone. I, 35 female, married my husband, 37 male, 10 years ago. Prior to our relationship, he had been married for two years to L, 22 female. Sadly, she passed away because of ongoing health issues. I met my husband five years after her passing. 
At the beginning of our relationship, I had some issues with his romantic history. To put it bluntly, I was having trouble accepting my husband's past and that he did not stop loving his late wife, but was forced to do so. I went to therapy for a year to treat that and I managed to overcome this issue. My husband knows this and was very supporting of me in the treatment. I now like to say that Elle and I would have been best friends. The issue. After 10 years of marriage, we've been having a lot of arguments derived from bad communication. We seem to just blow everything out of proportion. About three months ago, every time we have an argument, he takes the car and goes away for hours. When I asked where he went, he told me that he went to see her, L. Now, this is very weird from him because he, at best, visits L's grave three times a year. I then asked him not to run away every time we fight and to please tell me when he goes to the cemetery so we can go together. He just brushed me off. He's been doing this for months now and it's destroying me. The feelings I fought the first year of our relationship are coming back. I am sad all the time and I cry at night, but my husband just keeps going away for hours. At this point, I think he's doing it out of spite more than anything else. Yesterday, I reached my limit. We fought over frickin' trash, and that's how petty our arguments are. He took the car at 4 p.m., returned at 11 p.m. I was waiting for him at the dining room. The conversation went like this. Me. Where were you? Him. I visited her again. I've told you multiple times about how your actions hurt me, and you continue to do them. You can't stop me from going. Well, we can get a divorce. That way, you can marry Elle's tombstone, being that you care more about it than our marriage. I could see the shock in his face when I said that. I apologized immediately, but I think he didn't hear me. I saw how he started crying. He has been locked in his office since yesterday, and he refuses to come out. I feel like the biggest asshole ever. What I said was a low blow and something horrible. I attacked him where I knew he was going to hurt. But at the same time, a part of me thinks that what he is feeling right now is just a fraction of what he has put me through for months. I literally made a vow to Elle the day that I got engaged. I told her, you can take care of him from heaven and I'll take care of him from here on earth. I broke that vow. Is there any way I can salvage this relationship? Edit. A Redditor told me to put this in the post. Three months ago, we found out that I am pregnant after eight years of trying. He has been visibly stressed out and reactive since the discovery, even though we both wished for a baby. In the comments, the real question is, why are the two of you fighting so much all of a sudden? There is an underlying issue here and his dead wife isn't the problem. Him visiting her grave so often just shows that this isn't just about your fights, the issue is deeper here. OP replies, thank you for your tip. We found out that I was pregnant three months ago. He became very reactive and is visibly stressed out. The problem started since that discovery, even though we both wished for a baby for so long, sad face. Sounds like he's having some sort of trauma response or crisis to having a baby. You both have said and done hurtful things. It doesn't make you bad people, it makes you both humans who need the right tools to communicate your feelings and fears better. Likely the only thing you can do to salvage this is to get therapy, both of you, separate and together if possible. I'd say becoming a widower is different than being hung up on an ex as long as they're not actively grieving and having that negatively impact your relationship. It's just something that just always is going to exist. My grandfather says all the time that he's lucky enough to have had two great loves in his life. He was a widower. He's an amazing husband to my grandmother, and she acknowledges the fact that he had a past and that her death didn't and doesn't hurt their loving relationship. Your husband running to her grave every time you fight is certainly concerning. So talk about it, get into counseling and see where it goes from there. That's assuming you even want to fight for this. I'd imagine this has been a theme throughout your relationship and you've just overlooked it the entire time until you finally can't anymore. It's time to address it now, good luck. I am so confused. How is OP the bad one when he's leaving to his late wife's grave, not sure I believe that, for seven hours? And if he's coming back at 11, that would mean that he's there while it's dark. I don't know that I believe he is there either. Exactly. 
And what if he isn't even going to the cemetery? It's just an excuse. He finds fault in their relationship already, so maybe he's moving on with someone else or finding comfort on the side. The cemetery story is an easy cover-up for his real actions. She was right in calling him out how she did. If he cares more about his late wife than her, he needs to admit it and they can both move on. It's understandable for him to miss his late wife and still love her, but he's with this woman now and he is married to her. There has to be a boundary or a line, and he's crossed it multiple times already. And now on to the update. Hello everyone. My previous post was locked and removed, but I still wanted to update for everyone who kindly commented and left advice under the post. Before the update, I wanted to clarify something. I was only jealous of Elle in the first year of our relationship, but as I said, I worked through it in therapy. Throughout my relationship with my husband, I've hosted dinners in her honor, ordered embellishments for her grave, pushed my husband to reconnect with his former in-laws, and I even placed her in my altar of Dia de Muertos alongside my family members. I consider her a friend, even if I never met her. The Update We agreed on temporary separation, since we still don't know how we're going to co-parent and stuff like that. Shortly after my post, he came out of his office, and I made us both dinner, and we talked, for what feels the first time in months. First, I apologized about what I said, but I told him that the point still stands. I then asked him if he truly goes and sits at her grave for hours, and he said that he does not do that. Turns out that he sits at her grave for an hour at max, and then he goes on a tour around the city visiting their favorite places. He goes to restaurants and asks for her favorite dishes, drives around her favorite spots in the city. I then asked him why. Why was he doing it now that we found out I was pregnant after so much trying? He said that he couldn't avoid thinking about what it would have been like to raise a child with Elle and about how many things he missed experiencing with her. He did say that he did not regret our relationship, which makes it better, I guess. I also asked him if I failed him in any way. Was I a bad wife? A bad friend? Did I fail to fulfill his needs? He said that I just wasn't her. Honestly, I think I'd rather have someone punch me than him telling me that. Finally, I asked him when is he starting therapy. He responded that very soon because he wanted to be a good father. I said, fine, because I don't want someone around my child who grieves an imaginary child and an imaginary life when he has a living and breathing family. That's all I think. He moved out to his parents' house the same night. Her mother did call me to tell me that she and my father-in-law chewed him out for what he did. I thanked them and told them that I'm still very interested in them having a relationship with my child and they should not pay for their son's mistake. I also visited Elle, and I apologized for breaking my vow, but that I hope she's able to watch over husband and to help him throughout his therapy. I want to thank everyone who helped me realize my mistakes and how I was neglecting myself. You were all very helpful, and I owe you all a lot. Now in the comments, he said that I just wasn't her. Damn, that would make me leave. It sucks because he's just romanticizing everything about his ex, Maybe they did have a perfect relationship, but who knows if it would have stayed that way. But he gets to live in his perfect world in his head instead of living in the moment. He could have another perfect relationship with OP, but he refuses to acknowledge that. It's sad all round. Wow, I have heard of people romanticizing someone after they are gone, but this is a whole new level. She passed so young, and now in his mind, she has been built into this amazing and perfect woman who can never do wrong. It's almost comparable to a surviving sibling whose perfect brother died very young. You can never compete. It's not real and shouldn't be a competition. I'm really sorry that you're dealing with this. You deserve better, and he needs a therapist to help him deal with his intrusive thoughts. And now onto the final update. My soon-to-be ex-husband has changed and asked me to give our relationship a second chance, but I'm unsure. Hello, it's me again. Since my last post, a lot has happened. I gave birth to my son a bit over a month ago. He is the most beautiful baby ever. I love him more than anything. I've also been going to therapy, and it's been great. 
Overall, life is kinda dreamy right now. Doesn't seem real. Anyways, since everyone here was so helpful last time, I figured I would ask you for advice in this situation. After our separation, my husband started therapy. He was diagnosed with depression and is on meds. He also started to attend a grief support group. Since all of this happened, he has changed so much. It's like he's a different person. During all of my pregnancy, he has been so supportive, helpful, and respectful of my boundaries. He is also very apologetic and has asked for forgiveness for everything that he put me through this year. Like, he made a list of every way that he failed me and apologized for each one of those things. I've also attended many of his therapy sessions, apart from marital counseling. That helped me understand the immense grief that he's been carrying, apart from his own mental health issues, and how all of it became exacerbated with the arrival of our baby. The last three months of my pregnancy were pretty bad. The doctor advised me to move as little as possible. My husband offered to be my live-in nurse, and I accepted. So we've been living together for the past four months. Of course, we don't sleep in the same room or anything like that. He's been so great with me. We've had so many amazing conversations, and we just work wonderfully together. I feel like I've regained my husband, that the person I married is here again. After putting the baby to sleep yesterday, we had a conversation. He told me that he thinks he's ready to rekindle our relationship and asked me for a second chance. He told me that he will do anything he can to be deserving of a second chance. I honestly don't know what to do. Like this past year, I watched him try to better himself and succeed at it, but he's also been so kind to me and is great with our son. But I also know that he's in a pretty vulnerable state right now, and I really don't know if I would be able to pick up our relationship where it ended. I don't know what to do. Should I give it a try? Now in the comments, I would try, but I would take it slow, like very slow. A few dates maybe, but I'm not going to lie, the part when he said that you are not her, I just couldn't get over that. It sounds like you are both doing much better. Good for you both. Only you will know the answer to that question. I would say go for it. Sounds like you two still care about and are good for each other. But trust no one on Reddit. Only you know everything that has happened and all the changes that have taken place. Use what you have learned in therapy and trust your gut on rather to start something again or not. If he's already living there and he's good to you and you feel good, then ask yourself, why not give it a go? Discuss the list of pros and cons with your therapist, maybe. Good luck to you. I wish you both and the baby the best. This one is all around awful. Grief can do horrible things to a person. If there is one thing I hope posts like this do, it's to normalize therapy. I've gone to therapy to work through issues and better myself. Mental health is vital, and if you suppress trauma for a decade or so, it'll come back to manifest itself in weird ways. I hope OP, her co-parent, and their child are happy and healthy, even if they don't end up together. What I'm not sure is whether he started suffering depression and it latched to the old grief, or the old grief caused the depression. It didn't sound like he had such an unhealthy grief before, so it may have been mismanaged mental illness. It definitely raises awareness about therapy, as you say. It sounds like he just never dealt with his grief. When I read in her first post how she attended therapy to deal with his grief, I was thinking, wait, why isn't he attending therapy to deal with his grief? It sounds like something he should have done long before he even started dating again, instead of putting her through 10 years of misery and escalating to the point of separation. I'm really glad that he's doing so much better now, but it's annoying that they lost so much happy and healthy relationship time together. I don't think there could ever be any getting past the I just wasn't her comment. Mentally, I don't know if I could handle it after 10 years. That's you, and probably me too, but if OP can, and believes they'll find love and happiness in a second chance, I hope she lets herself have it. And if she doesn't believe it'll work, I hope she doesn't beat herself up over it. Our next post is titled, Soon everyone will know he's been messing with his stepmother and stepsister. For a little while, I've suspected my husband of cheating. I didn't have any justification for thinking or feeling this way, but I couldn't stop having this gut feeling that something was wrong. So I decided to keep a closer eye on him, and I still found nothing. And for a long time, I was angry with myself for suspecting him and for invading his privacy. 
We went to marriage counseling, and I apologized for breaking his trust in me, and for a little while all was well. I can't believe I apologized to that lying sack of crap, but that wretched feeling never went away. I tried so hard to get over this feeling that he was deceiving me in some way, and I just couldn't. So I decided that it was time to hire a private investigator instead of playing Inspector Gadget myself. Let me tell you, this was the best thing I ever spent money on. Within a month, the PI was able to confirm my suspicions, but it was a shock to find out that it was his stepsister and his stepmother. Not only that, but he may be the father of his stepsister's newborn baby. I could have killed him, but I kept my composure, and I kept this information to myself, and continued to act as normal as possible. Believe me, that was a very difficult thing to do. I slowly started detaching myself from him, and even moved into our spare bedroom, and we continued to drift apart. I moved out, got a new job, and started saving money for our divorce. I got my life in order. Now here we are, almost a year later, and in the final stages of our divorce, and I've still not told anyone. I've spent the last year preparing for our divorce, because I'll be damned to leave this marriage empty-handed. I wanted to handle our financial affairs first, because my husband works for his father, and I didn't want to leave him unemployed during our divorce process. This son of a bitch dragged out our divorce and fought me for everything, even things that were mine to begin with. But I kept my calm, and I won't say a word until I get everything I deserve. That's when I'll tell his father. And his father is not a man to be messed with. I've been assured the check will clear in three days or less, and it's over for Robert, because as soon as that money hits my account, his mother, stepmother, stepsister, brother-in-law, and father will receive a beautifully written email with pictures and videos of what he's been up to. His dad will tear him apart. Count your days, Robert. In the comments, I just gotta say, I've worked for a private investigator, and cheating spouse cases are sad, but also feel good to solve. Even when it sucks, everyone deserves answers. How often were they hired for that purpose, and were they usually cheating most of the time? Well, it depends. We are hired for that purpose a lot, really, and most of the cases, all the ones I solved, for example, they were cheating. My job is to prove to my client the affair, but when they come with their insights, I already know that's the case. Just go for the proof. Everything changes when you're trying to keep a secret. I really hope for your sake that he doesn't find this and ruin your plans. There was a girl on here who was planning on burning her boyfriend's world to the ground and posted it the night before, and he found it and ruined everything. And now on to the follow-up. Let's clear some things up. When Robert's father remarried, Robert was already a 30-year-old man, so no, he wasn't sexually groomed, and his stepsister was 31 when she met him. Again, no one here is being sexually abused. All involved were already well into adulthood when meeting, and when they started to screw around. As for the money, well honey, that's money he owed me, but he was being a dick about giving it back. I invested in his business ventures, and he refused to pay me my share. And that's not crap I was willing to let slide. You can't get a broke man to pay his debt. So F yes, I wasn't going to let him be unemployed during our divorce. The aftermath. I sent the email as soon as I saw the money had hit my account. The first to call me was Robert, and I picked up. First words out of his mouth were, You evil ass cow? I replied with, Your mama, and I ended the call. The second person to call me is stepsister's husband. He was just heartbroken. He asked me a ton of questions, and he asked for my divorce lawyer's information. We also discussed him getting a DNA test for all their kids. Through brother-in-law, I found out there was an all-out war between stepmother and father-in-law. He tried to kick her out, but she locked herself up in her bedroom. While the father-in-law was throwing her crap outside, stepmother-in-law called her daughter for help. At some point, stepsister and stepmother got in a fight. The fight was so bad that the neighbors called the police. In the scuffle to separate mother and daughter, they hurt one of the police officers and were arrested. They are still in jail because neither of them have anyone willing to bail them out. The following day, I got a call from Robert telling me that his daddy almost ran him over. So he wanted to come stay with me because he's scared that his daddy or brother-in-law will try to beat his ass again. Robert is scared to go home. His dad and brother-in-law are pretty much camped outside of his place and have already jumped him twice. 
Robert is terrified. He tried to stay with his mother, and she told him that he had made his bed and should now lie in it. FYI, I am not done with Robert yet. I've got more planned for him. In the comments, you should let him stay with you and invite the father and brother-in-law, then go to the supermarket. You know, go and grab a bag of popcorn. And OP says, and have their fight destroy my new home? I think not. He's... He's really asking the woman he cheated on and dragged through a messy divorce if he could stay with her. This man seriously has no self-preservation instincts. Well, he might, as in he might try to kill her and preserve what he thinks is left of his dignity. Because jilted ex-husband wouldn't be the first on the list of suspects, huh? I get what you're saying, but uh, kinda reinforces the whole no preservation instincts. Quote, he tried to stay with his mother, and she told him that he had made his bed and should now lie in it. Do we need to remind the both of them that this was a bed belonging to his father? I feel bad for OP, but this is nuclear revenge, completely deserved. Daddy Dearest and ex-brother-in-law are going to kick his ass. Imagine cheating not only with your stepsister, but also her mom. I don't think this is revenge at all. He did all of this to himself. She only waited to share what she knew so she wouldn't get screwed over in the divorce. There really isn't anything devious about anything she did. Edited to add, I am so surprised by all the comments saying this is nuclear revenge. She's not causing the family to explode. He did that. He used to blame for all of it, and it was going to come out eventually. Revenge would be doing something equal or worse to him to punish him for his actions. Wanting to make sure that she gets her fair share in a divorce is also not revenge. It's the rational thing to do. Kind of like how abuse victims play along and then leave all of a sudden with no warning. You want to make sure you're safe and covered before revealing your hand. There's no reason to be a martyr. My husband got weird about physical affection from me and things escalated very badly. My, 36 female, husband, 34 male, married for two years and together for five years altogether, used to be very affectionate with each other in a way that was playful, flirty, and warm. A couple months ago, he decided that I was too clingy and that he wanted to be the one to initiate all physical contact from then on. I do not think that I was or am clingy. I initiate hugs and kisses a few times a day with a few other casual touches like a hand on the shoulder but was very far from groping him every second. I know he has also been coming to terms with some issues from a difficult childhood at that time. Not physical abuse, more emotional abandonment slash alienation issues with his parents. So I wanted to give him space and not make this about me, especially as he promised to continue being regularly affectionate. And he has done so. Maybe a bit less than before, but we still have some affectionate touches initiated by him every day, and more intimate activities a couple of times a week. Used to be more like three to four times a week, but again, I know he's going through some stuff. A few days ago, I found out at work that I had gotten a big promotion and bonus. When I got home, I was so excited that I threw my arms around him, thereby violating his rule that he needed to be the one to initiate contact. He immediately pushed me away and got extremely angry. It wasn't a sexual hug at all, more like the kind you see sports team members giving each other when they win a big game. I tried to apologize, but he started yelling about how I'm an abuser and traumatized him. He asked me to leave. I quickly packed a few things and went to a motel, not wanting things to escalate further. I understand from his brother that after I left, he tried to go to the police to press charges, but they said that that's a quick hug from one's wife even if not really wanted or expected, was not the kind of thing they are going to prosecute. He's now threatening to call my employer to tell them that I'm an abuser who engages in sexual misconduct in my personal life. I am not asking for legal advice about that here. What I'm asking is, honestly, would he be justified in telling my employer about what happened? I did make a terrible mistake, even if it wasn't malicious. I believe people are allowed to determine that they don't want others to initiate touch and should have bodily autonomy. Just because I wouldn't be traumatized over a hug doesn't mean he shouldn't be. I'm willing to accept that he may very well divorce me over this and that I may lose other important friendships and family relationships, but should I also lose my job? My job is working with other adults in an office, not vulnerable people. 
I don't, and have never initiated physical contact with coworkers, except an occasional handshake or accepting a high five. In the comments, your husband is a literal danger to you. He's trying to send you to prison and ruin your life because of a mistaken hug. His mental issues have advanced to the point where it is no longer safe for you to be around him. Please consult an attorney. If your husband feels so unsafe around you, do him the favor of removing yourself from his life. Also consider a restraining order on him since he's harassing you at work. It's sad, but you're correct. Husband has obviously gone beyond the point where he can maintain a healthy relationship due to his issues. The fact that he turns to violent behavior, pushing, screaming, is specifically concerning. Appropriate reaction. Stepping back and saying, please remember to respect my physical boundaries. I'm happy for you, but I still need space. Massively insane overreaction, everything your husband did. Warn your boss that your husband is unstable. He's having some kind of mental health crisis and you're the target. Talk to a lawyer. He's trying to ruin your life because you hugged your husband. You need a lawyer to protect yourself, assets, and job. You also need to consider if he's a physical danger to you. This is incredibly unhinged. I've never made a post before, but I will for this. I suffer from complex PTSD and regularly have flashbacks and feelings of discomfort from physical touch. My partner is a very affectionate person and I recognize this. He also is aware that sometimes I get to be too overstimulated and overwhelmed if he's trying to kiss me or hug me and I'm not in a good headspace to receive this type of affection and backs off. There's been times where he has mistakenly triggered a flashback and it took time to calm me down. With all that being said, I would never accuse him of being an abuser over something like that. My past trauma is not inherently his responsibility and triggers happen. Triggers are also going to happen, but he's my partner for a reason. He's my support, and even if I felt like he did cross a line for whatever reason, there's nothing that would make me behave in such a way without at least talking to him first. I think that's very unfair for him to do that to you, considering you're in a relationship. Mistakes happen, but there's something deeper going on that needs to be addressed. Sorry, OP. And OP replies, Thank you for saying this. I would never want to do anything to harm my husband, and would have understood if he was very distressed in the moment, even if a hug doesn't seem like a big deal to most people. It just hurts so much to be lumped in with violent abusers, and to be made to feel like I'm a horrible person who deserves to have my whole life ruined. And now, on to the update. So, things came to a head, but not in the way that I was expecting. My husband's brother, brother-in-law, continued to stay with him while I stayed at a hotel. After a couple days, I got a call from brother-in-law asking me to come home so that we could all talk. He assured me that I would be safe. Turns out, my husband has been having an affair with an intern at his company, 21 female, and is deeply in love and wants to be with her. He told brother-in-law this shortly after I left. He wanted to make me the bad guy, so first started with the no touching rule, figured that I would get fed up with it, or that eventually I would make a mistake, and he could use that to claim that I was an abuser, that is what happened, so that I would be the bad guy. It was also a way to reduce intimacy of all types with me, while he was falling out of love with me, and in love with his affair partner. So he made up the stuff about trauma flaring up and isn't actually having a psychotic break, although obviously has some level of mental problems to do something so cruel. For what it's worth, he did apologize, sort of. Said he was just so in love with the other woman and couldn't deal with hurting me directly by leaving me right away, so came up with this plan and just got a little too caught up in character when I gave him the mistaken hug with calling me an abuser, making a police report, and threatening my job. We sat down and talked about everything, with brother-in-law as mediator, and agreed to a cordial and quick divorce, dividing assets 50-50. Thankfully, no pets or kids. I know I could probably make things harder for him under the circumstances, but I really just want to move on as soon as possible and put all of this behind me. I have a good job slash income and don't need anything from him other than my freedom ASAP. I appreciate all of you who commented and all those who sent me messages. Apologies for not responding personally to everyone, but was a bit overwhelmed. 
Even though things went in an unexpected direction, it was so helpful to see what was happening wasn't normal, and also helped me to prepare for the truth when it came out. Thank you. In the comments, while he would deserve you absolutely destroying him, he's proven he's an absolute lunatic and is willing to destroy your life to get out of an uncomfortable conversation. So it's way safer for you to just cut your losses and get out as soon as you can. Save everything you can in terms of documentation though, and see if you can get someone to get pictures of him with the affair partner before the divorce, just in case he goes psycho again. OP replies, Thank you, that is a good idea. I'll talk to my lawyer about the best way to document everything in case there's ever any question about the truth. What an effing loser. Wait and see. Once this 21 year old knows you're out of the picture permanently, she'll probably dump him lol, and it'll be well deserved. OP says, yes, because she may be in love now, but pretty soon I think she's going to realize that she's won the grand prize of a man who A, cheats with someone at work no less, and B, who will make up horrible lies to avoid taking accountability for his choices. What a gem. Okay, but he's how old and messing around with a 21 year old intern at work? Sounds like you need to call his work. Not only is there a big age gap, but there is a power gap as well. Add his narcissist type behavior and yeah. If she leaves him after he gave up on his wife and life for her, it's going to end badly for her. OP says, I mean, she's an adult, at least technically. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. He says she's in a different department, so he's not her manager, and it's not against the rules, although somewhat frowned upon. It's actually one of the reasons I wanted to do our divorce settlement quickly, in case he gets fired. I don't want to get stuck paying alimony because he suddenly doesn't have an income. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of that. Definitely let the divorce finalize first. I should say I'm proud of you for getting out quickly. He sounds awful to be honest, and you sound lovely. OP says, we actually already have a signed agreement, although it'll take a bit to finalize legally. I spent the bonus I mentioned in my earlier post on a good divorce lawyer who could draw up the agreement right away, saying how we are dividing existing accounts and property and that we aren't entitled to each other's income or retirement. He wants to move on with the new girl, so he wanted to do things as fast as possible too. I'm just looking forward to him no longer being my problem in any capacity. You should get a pet though. I don't know why, I just feel like it'd be trading up. OP says, yes, going to look for a pet friendly apartment. I love cats, he doesn't. Should have been my first clue. Our next post is titled, I disinvited my adopted sister from my wedding and I don't think we will ever speak to each other again. I'm heartbroken. I'm the youngest of two children. My parents always wanted a big family, but they had a string of miscarriages. So they turned to adoption. They had a baby girl through a closed adoption. Seven months after they adopted my sister, they conceived me. My parents said that I was their miracle baby. For context, my parents and I are white. My sister is Hispanic and black. Growing up, my sister and I were best friends. We did everything together and people said that we acted like twins. We stayed best friends into adulthood until she found her biological family. At first I was happy for her. My sister always said that she felt like something was missing and finding her family seemed to be the missing piece. But then she started to treat my parents differently. She would constantly berate them for choosing to adopt because she said adoption, especially transracial adoption, was wrong. She said that the experience was traumatizing to her and that she wasn't properly prepared for being a person of color due to their color blindness. I stayed out of it because her relationship with my parents wasn't my business. But when she made my mom cry after a particularly cruel remark, I started distancing myself from her. For context, she said that they should have gotten therapy for their infertility instead of becoming baby snatchers. Even though we weren't friends anymore, I couldn't imagine severing the relationship, and I definitely couldn't imagine disinviting her from my wedding. She was the one who introduced me to my fiance after all. So I told myself that she was my sister no matter what and kept her as my maid of honor. I changed my mind after she posted a picture of herself with her biological siblings. She captioned it, it's been such a relief to find my real family. I finally feel like I'm home. I was beyond upset. 
I never, ever thought of her as anything less than my sister, but apparently I was never a sister to her. I didn't trust myself to call her, so I sent a text. Since you don't see me as your real sister, there's no reason for you, and her boyfriend's name here, to come to my wedding. I blocked her number after that. She blocked me on everything in response. Our mutual friends are telling me that she's calling me a racist. I don't think there is any way to come back from this. I'm heartbroken about losing my sister, and I'm heartbroken that I never had one in the first place. In the comments, as a black man who was adopted by a wonderful white family, I am shook at this. My adopted family had a lot of fertility issues, and she took in me and two of my biological siblings, one half, since birth, and honestly gave us the best life we could have had. My birth parents did drugs and crap. I can only imagine that life. I don't know how some people could be so ungrateful to have been adopted by a good family, because that doesn't always happen. I was lucky my adopted mom kept in touch with my biological grandma, so I'm able to know the other eight siblings I have, and other family growing up. I'm 24 now, and I wouldn't have it any other way. OP, I'm so sorry. I have a half-brother and sister whose birth dad was adopted. We're all the same ethnicity. After she took an ancestry DNA test, she found a number of their bio father's bio family members. She turned into the biggest asshole. She turned on everyone in our family, including my bio dad who adopted her when she was five. He raised them. Their birth dad skipped out on our mutual mom and became a drug addict. It eventually killed him. She's treated my dad like trash since finding her bio dad's family. She dumped us and started spending her birthdays and holidays with her new family. It hurts. However, she was petty and spiteful when she was in my life. She was constantly bad-mouthing our siblings and planning out small slights against them. She was jealous of all of us. She never felt loved enough. This was in her head. Our parents love her as much as the rest of us. She was always so focused on what she didn't get. It hurt when she cut us out of her life, and it continues to hurt. I can't make predictions about how your situation will turn out, but be there for your parents and try to be open to her eventually coming back. She must be euphoric by having her bio family validate her right now. Eventually, that will wear off. Sounds like she's unpacking a lot regarding her identity and is unfairly lashing out. That doesn't mean you or your parents have to put up with it. Keep your distance while she figures herself out. Yeah, just because she's finding herself out doesn't give her the right to be cruel to others. Yep, and this is something she should know intuitively. What a shame. OP's parents raised her. I have seen many cases of adopted family becoming bad influences to the kid, but in this post, it feels like they had the best childhood. Real family doesn't come from blood. It's from love and compassion. Back up to the post, there are some edits. Edit 1, please stop insulting her in the comments. Edit 2, someone asked for context about the Miracle Baby comment, and a different commenter said that I should add the response to the post. Quote, it makes both of us super uncomfortable. My parents think adopting my sister put my mum in the right state of mind to successfully carry a baby. They've called my sister the best thing to ever happen to them because she not only gave them a child, but a whole family. Edit 3, we talked this morning. One of our mutual friends asked me to unblock my sister on her behalf. I called her and we had a long conversation about everything. I apologized for blocking and disinviting her without talking to her first. She apologized for being hurtful in the post. She's going to delete the posts calling me a racist and publicly apologize for calling me one. We agreed to keep each other blocked on social media because it will only lead to hurt feelings otherwise. She is still coming to my wedding, but not as a maid of honor. We're not back to where we were, but my sister says that this is a good thing. Now that we got all our feelings out in the open, we can build a healthier and stronger relationship. Thank you for all the DMs. They helped me articulate myself while also staying sympathetic to her point of view. And now onto the update. After my last post, I got comments and DMs saying that I shouldn't have reconciled with her. I should have listened. Yesterday, my parents offered to treat us to dinner. I couldn't make it, but my sister decided to go. From what my mum told me, the topic of my sister's adoption came up. They got into a fight about it in the middle of a crowded restaurant. 
It ended after my sister said that my parents should have accepted that their miscarriages were a sign from God that they weren't meant to be parents. For context, my parents are very religious. Growing up, they told us that God got them through the heartbreak of those miscarriages. My parents aren't perfect, but they didn't deserve that. Nobody does. I'm tired of making excuses for my sister. I'm tired of being sympathetic to her trauma when she weaponizes it to hurt others. I'm done. I should have been done after the baby snatching comment. She's not in my life anymore, and I'm trying to convince my parents to do the same. I sent her one final text that said, I can't believe you would say that to mom. What the F is wrong with you? Don't contact me again. Go be with your real family and leave us the hell alone. In the comments, does she not understand that if your parents didn't adopt her, that her birth family wanted to put her up for adoption, she still would have put her up for adoption. Without context, the assumption here is that the birth family decides not to keep their baby, adoptive family decides to adopt a baby. If the second part of that didn't happen, the first part still would have. So by her logic, no child should ever get adopted even if the birth family is giving them up. So then they'd grow up bounced around foster care. I know there are bad adoptive parents, and adoption is traumatic for the child, but it sounds like she was happy until recently. What did she want? Her birth families are the ones who made the choice, for whatever reason, to give her up. Her logic makes no sense. Of course, I can admit there's always the chance we're missing context here, and that what I'm saying is on the assumption that this was a birth family doesn't want baby, adoptive family adopts a baby and gets matched with this one situation, which could be wrong, in which case my opinion would change. We don't know the circumstances surrounding the adoption or giving up of the baby, so I'm just going off what I'm reading. So I know there's a chance that it's more complicated than that. Edit, why did OP block me? I was on your side, damn. Someone replies to that, I think we're missing context. OP has blocked multiple people for even trying to suggest a different opinion. Edit, OP blocked me five seconds after I made this comment. It's either she's going through a personal crisis or she's just an ungrateful brat. I wonder if she told her biological parents that having her was a sign from God that they should be parents and not give her up for adoption. I don't really think so, because she sounds like a hypocrite. Her bio parents left her only to come back when the whole parenting thing was done. P.O.S. Her bio parents are the ones feeding her that baby snatching slash you should have taken the miscarriages as a sign of God bullcrap. That kind of crap doesn't just pop into your head one morning, and it definitely doesn't suddenly cause you to feel so deeply about it that you turn on your family. I'd be comfortable placing a pretty high bet that it's the bio parents. Possibly. There is also a small but vocal community online of interracial adoptees who really resent feeling cut off from their native culture. I'm not part of the adoptive community at all, so I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on any of this. I only know about it from an acquaintance of mine who is Korean born, but American adopted, and what she said condemning that community. Essentially, there's a grain of merit to their argument, but then some people take it way too far and get toxic, often turning on their adoptive families and blaming them. Anyway, all that to say, the bio parents could be perfectly nice people, and sister has just fallen in with the wrong crowd online and is feeding into their bullcrap. I don't even know what to think, it seems that they all need therapy, but the adopted daughter really needs to talk to someone. What a sad post. The big issue for adoptees is that no one will acknowledge their trauma because they were saved by their adoptive families. The 2008 CDC report talking about the supply of infants really highlights how absurd views on adoptions are. It's a huge problem. Quote, my parents think adopting my sister put my mom in the right state of mind to successfully carry a baby. A bit off topic, but this is not unheard of. The rest of the post is so sad, and the sister is so cruel though. Suddenly being able to carry a child to term after adopting one after years of miscarriage is actually relatively common. I've always wondered why. I'm an adopted child. My mother was told the same thing after too many miscarriages. A childhood illness had taken her ability to have children. So, my parents adopted me. What do you know, once the pressure was off, out popped my brother a couple of years later. Then my sister a couple of years after that. 
While I'm not a POC, I have found and formed a relationship with my birth mother and never in a million years would I consider her my mum or anything of the sort. Navigating new relationships after reconciliation is challenging. You have an intimate bond with these people, yet they're strangers. However, to discard your adoptive family, especially if their intentions and your upbringing were with the best intentions, is nothing but callous. Am I the asshole for wanting my husband to start paying more for our housing? Hi all. For reference, I am 29 female and my husband is 30 male. We've been together since I was 20 and got married when I was 26. When we moved in together when I was 25, we were splitting our rent evenly. I was making 65k and he was making 80k and we live in a large US city. It didn't really make a huge difference in my budget versus his to split the rent 50-50 for 2600 a month rent. However, things have changed. I got pregnant a few months after we got married, which we were so happy about and wanted. I didn't want to not work, but I wanted to be home with our baby, so I found a full-time remote job in my field of work. The downside is I took a cut to my salary from 65k to 50k. We continued to split rent in our apartment. My husband, between being 26 and 30, has received a number of raises and has switched his job. He is now a senior business analyst, making roughly 195k a year. Since we were having a child, we were going to need a bigger apartment. We found a three bedroom for 4k per month. He still wanted to split rent evenly, despite my protests, and despite me wanting to try to find a smaller apartment for less. In the end, I sort of let myself get walked over because he really is such a smooth talker and I do love him. Anyway, flash forward two and a half years, our rent has increased to 4,400. My take home pay monthly after taxes is roughly 3,600. I'm paying 2.2K monthly in rent. I'm also taking care of our baby and our home, doing chores and cooking daily. My husband works from eight to six, but typically doesn't get home until around seven. I am burnt out. I barely have enough money per month to do things that I enjoy. I feel like I'm financially struggling while my husband is living a life of luxury. Yes, he does take me out on dates and on vacation, but he doesn't seem to understand that this is not enough for me. I spoke to him two days ago very seriously, and when I asked about trying to split rent based on our income and pay an equal percentage of our income so that it's more fair than fully equal, his reaction stunned me. He asked me why having 1.6k extra a month wasn't enough for me. I told him that I'm not saving anything. He told me that I should spend less on extracurricular activities, which makes me laugh because what extracurricular activities? All I do is work, cook, clean, shop for the house and raise our child. I told him I'm basically working two full-time jobs at once and I need help. Then he asked me if I'm suggesting he pay for me being a mother, and that stunned me. I really had no response to that. Anyway, he told me that this is the lifestyle we agreed when we moved in together way back when. However, he doesn't seem to understand, or rather does not want to understand. Now he's mad with me because he thinks I'm being selfish and has been acting cold to me these past few days. I'm getting the itch to apologize and take it back like I always do, but I really feel like I'm right here. Am I the asshole? In the comments, not the asshole. Married people with children who keep separate bank accounts and argue about who pays for what are weird. You're not roommates. OP replies, that is exactly what I'm trying to say. Not to mention that he is the sole beneficiary of his millionaire parents. I came from poverty and worked to get where I am. I do try to keep that out of the arguments though, as that is his business and not ours. I just want to make it clear that I am not a gold digger here. I did choose to work, but it also makes me wonder that if I didn't work, if he would help me at all. If you didn't work, he'd give you a paltry allowance and then micromanage how you spend it. Honestly, I'd drag him to counseling. This is that serious. He's not 100% invested in your marriage slash family. OP replies, yeah, but the issue is, who would pay for counseling? I probably can't afford the upkeep of 50-50 and definitely not 100% since it's my idea. Counseling, like all other joint expenses, should be split proportionally based on income. 
If his reaction when you tell him that your marriage has deteriorated to the point of needing counseling is, I'm not paying for that, then you should skip counseling and consider a divorce attorney instead. If your husband isn't going to act like your partner, there is no point in continuing to subsidize his lifestyle, because right now, you are literally paying a share of his bills just because he's too selfish to want to fairly split the cost of his own family with you. Not the asshole. This is a strange financial situation. You are married and in a partnership, your finances need to reflect that. Your hubby also needs to be way more flexible. Are you going to live your whole lives together by a set of rules agreed when you were 20? Is that how he still expects you to live at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80? I'm assuming when you made this agreement, you hadn't factored your kids in. You guys need to sit down and work out a joint budget and start using joint accounts. OP replies, yes, we made this agreement when we were making similar incomes, didn't have kids, and weren't married. Also, he wasn't paying his half of the rent when we lived together as a young couple. His parents were to help him build savings. What a hypocrite. I'm sorry, I just really am upset on your behalf. Seriously, the crux of the moral issue is not just that he thinks that he shouldn't share resources as a married couple, already pretty screwed up given that this guy comes from generational wealth and I'm quite certain he doesn't work harder than OP, to say nothing of the fact that he doesn't give a flying F about her happiness, it's that he doesn't think his child is his responsibility. The premise of shared finances and alimony, which OP should get a fat stack of, is that families agree on a division of labor within the household. Childcare is a massive share of that labor, and by refusing to share any of this extravagant wealth with the person doing it, he is abdicating his responsibility as a parent. If he had hired someone to do his childcare, that person would be entitled to payment, but his demanding OP subsist on income from an entirely separate job and take on the second one for nothing? Personally, I couldn't stay with a cruel, greedy piggy who had so little respect for me. The labor that I performed raising our child, and by extension, our child. And I really hope that OP didn't sign a prenup with this creep. Back up to the post, we have an edit. Thank you for all of the responses. I can honestly say that I did not expect to get this feedback. I'm honestly overwhelmed and cannot reply to all of you, especially while I'm working, but I wanted to update some things here. I love my husband with all my heart, and it's heartbreaking for me to read these comments and realize that I'm being taken advantage of. I need to figure out the best way to approach this issue and solve it before it gets too far. I want to work this out, and the fear of being alone is haunting me. Yes, I did sign a prenup that it was overseen by his family attorney. My husband comes from extreme wealth, and I was young and stupid and went with it. Head over heels, like my mother always said I was. As for his family, we get along great and they love me. It's very confusing because they are such incredibly generous people and they are family, but they don't know about our financial situation because my husband and I believe that our marriage is private, and I would feel like I was betraying him by telling them. I'm sorry I cannot reply to all of you, but please know that I'm reading all of the comments and making a plan of approach with them. Edit 2, for those talking about the dates and vacations bit that he pays for, I've asked him numerous times to help lighten my financial load instead of going on these trips and dates, and he has refused. He said that he can do what he wants with his money, and if he wants to take us on vacation, that is what he will pay for. If I could afford vacation, I would pay. In fact, when we were in a more even financial situation, unmarried, no kids, I paid for almost all of our vacations and dates because I love to treat people, and I can't do that anymore. Edit 3, I also do not have bad spending habits. I worked my way out of my student loan debt in two years after graduating, I saved 60k by the time we got married, and now I have all of that in my retirement, which I'm thankful for because I can no longer contribute to it. This has nothing to do with how I spend. I actually am pretty frugal when it comes to shopping, especially since I prefer to keep things cheap for my budget. And now, on to the update. I sincerely apologize for taking so long to return to Reddit and write an update to this. A lot has happened since. 
For those who don't know, this post was originally written at the end of February of 2020. The world, therefore after, fell apart. Things were not good with me and my husband at the time of this post. I want to preface this by saying we are still together to this day and we've welcomed a new child to this world. This time in a much healthier environment. COVID changed a lot for me, along with the intense virality of the last post. Neither my husband nor I got laid off or furloughed, and we were and are so thankful, but my husband moved to work from home. That perspective shift changed a lot for him when he saw what I had to deal with day to day. Things I could never properly communicate about how difficult it is to work while raising a child, and what I brought to the table that he could never see. Despite his newfound appreciation for me, I still found myself resenting him. It was in June that I finally proposed that we go to couples counseling after doing my own virtual therapy sessions since March, from which I learned about why I let people step over me based on my childhood and past, and how to overcome that. To my surprise, my husband agreed, and so we've been in weekly counseling since, even to this day. It helped him to get to the root of his fears and address why he has trouble trusting me financially, which had less to do with me and more to do with what he was brought up believing and had been instilled with. After coming to the point of telling him that I wouldn't want to continue building a family or a life with him where he watched me struggle from luxury, with the help of our amazing counselor who guided us, my husband was willing to adjust our lifestyle to be more equal. I'm not saying everything was or is magically perfect. I know people wanted an update where I left my evil husband and took my baby to start a new life, but I did marry this man for a reason. I saw the good and past this struggle that we've had to overcome. He's become the man that I knew I'd married. We now have a joint bank account as well as our own on the side. We each put two thirds of our income into the shared account and get to keep one third for ourselves. I'm in a new job now and making much more money than in the original post. Not that this affects the relationship, but so people know that my one third is enough for me to enjoy. It's still a road to recovery, but we have more trust between us and are no longer living a 50-50 lifestyle. Again, I'm sorry for not updating sooner, but the past few years have been a lot for us and everyone. Thank you for all of your support and advice. I promise I wouldn't be sitting here typing this without it. In the comments, I don't know. If he really feels bad, he should pay her back for all the years in which she had nothing after paying for bills, and he still had 150 plus K year for spending. They've managed to reach an equilibrium that's benefiting both of them and are, more or less, thriving. Why even try to move forward if you're just going to keep bringing up the past? because she's still at a severe financial disadvantage for the future in terms of retirement savings if they split up. And who knows what's in that prenup which was overseen by OP's family lawyer only. She may have agreed to the 50-50 lifestyle and having a baby, but did she agree to be the only one cooking for the family, cleaning for the family, doing laundry for the family? All of that is free labor he was taking advantage of. Had I seen her original post, I would have suggested that she make him consider those hours in lieu of some of her contribution, or he could pay for a housekeeper. Classic example of the stay-at-home parents' contributions being disregarded and taken advantage of. Imagine making almost four times what your spouse does, and you want to stick to the same agreement you made when you first moved in together and before you had a child together. Blew my mind reading that. I will never understand long-term romantic partners having wildly disparate incomes and still treating their financial situation like they are two post-grads dating with approximately equal incomes. We're a family, except I have $10,000 to spend on myself every month and you only get $1,000. Just be grateful that I pay for the occasional vacations and some dates every now and then is some sociopathic bullcrap. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for taking in my sister without giving a heads up to my husband? Hear me out. I was at my parents' place. I was over to help out my mom with a garden. My younger sister is staying at home for college. It seems dad was yelling at her about something. He checked her phone and found that she is a lesbian. My mom was just watching her yell at him and backing him up. My sister was just crying. 
I am a pretty soft-spoken person, and I couldn't stop my dad from yelling. But when he was done, I told her to pack her stuff up and took her to my place. She is a pretty sensitive person, and my parents are pretty assertive and rude sometimes. I tried to text my husband, but he was in a meeting, and he rarely checks his phone while he works. He was surprised to find my sister in our home. I talked to him about it, and he's okay with it, but he's upset on two counts. The first being that I didn't give him any heads up and he hates being surprised by anything, and that he'll have to give up his quiet room which he uses to de-stress after work. He just hates having things jumped on him. He knows she has to stay here for a while, and it makes sense. I feel like an asshole, as I should have done things a little bit more calmly. I should have talked to my husband before getting her out of there. I was pretty emotional during this whole thing. It was one of the worst things I have witnessed. I know how much he loves his room, and how great it has been to his mental health to have a place to be alone and process things. It has helped our relationship a lot. I feel like I'm not prioritizing him here, and I took a major decision without consulting him. In the comments, no assholes here. You protected your sister, and that makes sense. In an emergency, sometimes you have to do things right now, and you didn't try to not tell him. Things just came to a head in that moment. He's allowed to be annoyed that there wasn't a discussion and that he's lost his quiet space. I wonder if there was a way to fix the loss of his quiet space, like another room? He gets an hour interrupted time in his bedroom? Etc. Exactly. There are ways to work it out during this summer at home. They both go to run errands and he gets to stay home and chill for a couple of hours. He gets treated to go to the movies by himself, you know? So on and so forth. Huh. There's a reason people spend a long time in the bathroom sometimes. My dad used to spend a couple of hours reading and pooping in the bathroom when we were kids. Now that I'm an adult, I totally get it. Lol, four kids and multiple foster kids. It was the only place for some quiet time. It's the kitchen for me. A while ago, anytime a kid or husband came in while I was chilling on the laptop or reading a magazine, I would ask them while they're here to unload the dishwasher or mop the floor or start dinner. Nobody comes in now while I'm there, or they quietly sneak in and grab a snack and then run like Usain Bolt. A lot of the time I've already emptied the dishwasher, but they never check. They just suddenly need the bathroom or have to go uh, do that thing with the uh, thingamabobber they've been meaning to do. My mother-in-law taught me this trick, and it's kept my sanity over lockdown. No assholes here. Of course he's thrown off by a new person in the house without prior discussion, but it sounds like he'll get over it. Sure, it would have been nice to do this calmly and less urgently, but you did what you had to do to help your sister. Oh look, in this instance, bringing someone in in a shared space without consulting the significant other is all good. But on other posts where someone brought their teen pregnant sister in and their girlfriend threw a fit, they were the asshole because they made the girlfriend uncomfortable. Hypocrites. And now onto the update. This is a strange update. My sister moved out and ended up leaving within a month, but her stay with us was illuminating in many ways. The things my sister pointed out to me helped me realize that our marriage was designed to cater to all of his wants and to meet the bare minimum of my needs. I tried to bring this up with him. Small things which could make me feel better, but he didn't want to. I suggested couples therapy, and he thought that it would just be a process of blame being pinned on one of us. I started therapy with my own money, and he was upset that I was wasting it when I was perfectly fine. I started to paint again, something that he didn't like, and he didn't scream at me, he just changed his routine a little so that I had less time to paint and make a mess, which he had to witness while I painted. My marriage was built around not making him sad. Throughout the relationship, I was the one who was responsible for his feelings, and I was the one who had to set mine aside to make him happy. I got out, and I am living with my sister. They had an extra room that they had been looking to sublet, and I took them up on it. It's funny that I ended up in the same position as my sister started out the post in. I am not happier. I miss him, and I have spent almost nine years with him, but it's liberating not to spend hours molding myself to make him happy. I'm a lot calmer now. I really want to thank the commenters who planted the seeds of doubt about my husband. In the comments, 
No one person can ever be responsible for the feelings of someone else. That's too much to ask and too big of a burden to place on someone you love. I'm glad you were able to help your sister while gaining perspective. I hope you find continued peace. My abusive father always made it my mum's responsibility to make him happy, and since he struggled with depression, he blamed that on her too. No one is ever responsible for another person's feelings, and if someone tries to make you feel responsible, you need to create a boundary very quickly. You've given me some serious food for thought. I think when I was depressed, I was unfairly blaming my partner for not doing enough to help make it better. I know that's messed up, but I couldn't see the forest for the trees at the time. One of the sneakiest things about depression is that you can't trust how you feel about people because your brain is screwed up and invested in remaining so. I was really surprised that the original top comments were saying no assholes here. I didn't feel like your now ex had any right to be mad that he didn't get a warning. And it seemed crazy to me that he was more upset at losing his quiet room than your sister's situation. While he had a right to be a bit taken aback, the right response to your sister's situation should have been, oh my god, how awful. Of course she can stay here until we can sort something more permanent out. You made a brave, bold move, and I'm glad that you are healing. Remember that it's never selfish to take care of yourself, and sometimes, that means putting yourself first. I'm happy for you, even if this will be a challenging time for you. You should be very proud of yourself. What struck me was the fact that he complained about not getting any warning when OP literally said that she tried calling and texting him on the way home. Given the situation, how much more notice was he expecting? Was she supposed to just leave her sister in a dangerous situation for several days to make sure he was good and ready to give up his quiet room? I was in a marriage like that. I got very chronically ill, and that's when I realized that everything I did was to make my ex happy, and he couldn't lift a finger to help me when I needed it. Because even minor inconveniences, such as emptying or loading the dishwasher, took away from his me time. When I left, he was literally buying new underwear and socks, and wearing wrinkled, dirty clothing because he simply refused to do his own laundry. It was a big eye-opener for me. I literally would have rather died alone than spend one more day in that marriage. I'm glad that OP got her eye opener before wasting any more of her time. Being sick, in my opinion, is one of the fastest ways to realize you're in an abusive relationship. Take note if your partner always seems to have an ailment when you're unwell. Same thing happened to me, but in a different way. I have to live with my family right now. I always hated my dad, but thanks to me being very sick, I slept all day for a few days and didn't take my narcolepsy meds to help me stay awake. I didn't notice before because he wasn't stealing enough at a time for me to notice, but the freaking moron kept stealing my Adderall when I hadn't taken any for three to four days, so it was pretty obvious at that point. I was wondering why he kept bugging me and coming into my room constantly when I was sick, but now I realize that that piece of crap was stealing the medicine I need to not sleep 17 hours in a row right next to me while I was asleep and in pain. Am I the asshole for refusing to wear a ring? My fiance, 27 female, and I, 30 male, have been together for almost four years and have been engaged for a couple of months. We're starting to get more seriously into wedding planning and the topic of rings came up. I don't wear jewelry, I barely wear colors, I'm on the autism spectrum and don't care to draw attention to myself. I didn't think this would be such a big deal, but I never saw myself wearing a ring. My fiance has different views on the subject. I knew her ring would mean a lot to her, so I listened over the years, spoke to her friends and her mother, and knew exactly what she wanted. So I got that for her when I proposed. She loved it. Fast forward to now, and she's not as happy. I explained my views on wearing jewelry, and she wasn't having it. She told me that it's a symbol of our commitment and thinks I want to appear single, but nothing could be further from the truth. I absolutely adore her, but I'm very stuck in my routines. I didn't think this would be a big deal, but she won't let it go. I told her I wasn't going to wear jewelry, and she lost it. She told me I'm selfish and won't talk to me. I don't get it. She knows I love her. I show her every day, and she's making such a big deal out of this. I need help. Am I the asshole? 
in the comments. No assholes here. I think you two need to find a compromise here. You have a sensory issue and have trouble with change. She sees you not wearing a ring as you not being serious about your marriage. Both of you have valid needs here. Have you looked at silicon rings? Like, you could have a gold band for your ceremony if she wants that, but a silicon one for every day. Or find the most important times to her for you to wear it and see if that works. If the silicon ring doesn't feel right, maybe a henna tattoo band or temporary tattoo. I don't recommend a permanent tattoo because I'm superstitious, and if you can't handle a ring, the itch of a healing tattoo will drive you nuts. This is very important to her, and if you can, I would try to find a way to honor it. And OP replies, This is such a thoughtful and helpful response. I can't thank you enough. I've said this elsewhere here, but embarrassingly, I didn't consider alternatives during our argument, and so many here, such as yourself, have given me excellent ideas. Even if she doesn't prefer these suggestions, I think just showing her that I hear her concerns and want to remedy this will help. I don't want her to feel like I'm not committed, but it just felt like she didn't understand my position. In fairness, I suck at communicating and usually hide my sensory issues. You're exactly right that I need to understand how and why this is important to her so we can find a solution. Thank you so much. Info. You say you don't want to draw attention to yourself, but wedding rings don't really draw attention since lots of people are married and wear them. Is there any other reason you don't want it? Have you talked about any compromise solutions? For example, a ring that's not made of metal and not shiny. There are rings that are made from carbon, for example. OP replies, As many others suggested, it's mostly sensory issues. I basically wear a uniform every day, almost identical clothing, keep my hair the exact same, etc. I can't stand the feeling of jewelry and visually find it distracting. When I have to dress differently, when my hair is blowing all over, if I have a cold sore, etc., I experience a lot of anxiety, which I'm working on with my therapist. We've discussed alternatives and I'm about to update the OP. I'm also autistic and newly married. I think you are not the asshole. I never wear jewelry, and especially not rings, because the feeling of jewelry on my body is just too much. It's distracting to me to the point of painful. Rings get caught on my clothes and hair, and I hate how I can constantly feel them. My husband and I are having similar conversations, where his feelings are a little hurt that I don't wear my ring more. He is also autistic though, so he gets these sensory issues. What I've been doing is keeping my ring off when I'm at home all day, I have a special place that I put it in my nightstand, and I wear it in the afternoon when he gets home from work, or if I'm going out. I get how wearing a ring feels awful. I also care about my spouse, and I don't want my actions to cause them pain. Is there some kind of compromise that you two could find? Could you put your ring on a necklace? Is there a different ring material that would work better for you for more frequent wear? And now, on to the update. I apologized to my fiancé for my reaction and for not considering why she felt the way she does, and we had a long talk. Previously, I really didn't understand why this was such an issue to her, but that shouldn't have mattered. The fact is, this is important to her, and I care about how she feels. I tried to explain why I'm so opposed to this, and I think she mostly gets it. She knows I struggle with these sorts of things, but really do try to work on these issues, and don't use them as excuses. I brought up many of the wonderful suggestions you all have made, and I think we'll be able to figure out a good compromise. What we're leaning towards now is having a ring to wear for the wedding, family events, etc. I'm already so uncomfortable in those situations, so it doesn't really matter. And I'm thinking about a tattoo on the underside of my finger so that I have a permanent symbol without the sensory problems or visual distraction. Thank you all so much for the input and helping me to better understand this so it doesn't cause a rift in an otherwise wonderful relationship with the absolutely most incredible woman I've ever met. I truly appreciate you all taking the time and offering insight. It means so much to me. In the comments, My husband wears one, but my dad never did. He's definitely undiagnosed ASD, no doubt in my mind. My parents have been married for over 50 years, and on their 50th anniversary, my mom got him a ring and now he wears it. I think it bothered her for 50 effing years. 
My husband has gained some weight and had to take his band off. I went right out and got him a new one. I lost the weight that he gained, and I had to get myself a new one too. We both definitely prefer the other, where's it? Communication wins, and I think a tattoo would be a lovely compromise. OP, I don't wear rings. Beyonce, you're not committed enough. OP, instead, I'll get a symbol that's always visible and I can't ever take off. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't see the underside of people's fingers that often. Why are people here so aggressive towards the fiance? To many people, the wedding ring is very important. Besides that, Opie explained to her why he's uncomfortable and she understood. So there really isn't a problem. She doesn't force him to wear the ring like another comment said either. I don't know, but I'm starting to feel like a lunatic for ascribing meaning to mine. It's a symbol of my relationship, and it's important to me. If my husband were unwilling to wear his, it wouldn't make me think that he wanted to cheat, but it would make me feel like he's emotionally distancing himself from me. I realize OP had valid reasons for his refusal, but up until the update, it's not like he had explained them to his fiance, so it seems natural to me that she'd be upset. But looking around these comments, it feels like there's something wrong with me for thinking that way. Our next post is titled, I, 23 female, posted a thirst trap to teach my boyfriend, 28 male, a lesson. Ladies and guys, I'm young and I'm not very experienced, so I wanna know if I did the right thing. My boyfriend, whom I love so much, keeps liking thirst traps of one of his friends, who he did mention that she made a move on him in the past. I've always had this bad gut feeling about this specific friend of his, and he tried to reassure me that there is nothing and she has a boyfriend. This girl, let's call her Lexi, has a lot of typical bikini posts on her Insta. I'm not shaming her in any way, but I'm just trying to get my point through. Lexi has never posted anything about being in a relationship or having a boyfriend of any sort. I know you'd think maybe she wants to keep it private, but she's the type of girl who will even post what water she drinks. A month ago, he liked a pic of hers that was almost nude, and I asked him if he's okay with doing that. He said, yeah, she's a friend, I thought this is okay, and I asked him if he would mind if I posted the exact same picture and wore that. He said, no way. So, I calmly explained how it doesn't work like that. Today, I had the strong urge to check again, and yet again, there was a picture worse than before that he liked, and not just that, many others too of Lexi. I didn't ask him anything, and I posted a thirst trap myself with the same caption as that girl, a picture he strictly told me he wouldn't allow me to post anywhere. He hasn't seen it yet, but I don't know if I'm doing the right or wrong thing. My plan was for him to see it and prove my point. Help me out? Guys, can you please help me out, because I don't know how guys think. In the comments, you've trapped all of us. Now we want to know his reaction. Don't let us down. OP says, I don't know how things are going to go down, but I'll definitely try to update as soon as I can. I think if you need to teach your partner a lesson, you should be planning to move on. He sounds like he's not going to take accountability. I get loving him, but you're taking the hardest route to a lesson learned by millions of women a year. You can't change him. If he loved you or respected you as much as you do him, you wouldn't have had to do what you just did. He'd never put you in a place that you'd have to play this game. I literally just wrote a comment about accepting shitty relationships slash partners. You're conditioning yourself to make allowances, or in this case, play dirty in relationships. Don't let this guy teach you to be toxic to yourself, because if you carry these behaviors into a good relationship, there will be a Reddit post about you someday, if you get my meaning. That said, any situation where you have a bad gut feeling, trust it. If the friend is safe or things were truly platonic, bells wouldn't be going off in your head. In my opinion, it's literally never worth the risk nor the trouble. You are not being unreasonable. I read through your comments and saw that you've discussed this with him in the past, and he agreed to not do this, and then did it anyway. I suspect he low-key wants to hook up with that girl. Like, he's with you, but wants to keep his options open. Are you sure they're just friends? Sorry he's making you doubt yourself. Honestly, life is too short to put up with men who don't appreciate what they have. 
you are young and beautiful. Go find a boyfriend who will respect your relationship. This one doesn't. I read an article about a study a couple years ago about how men and women perceive opposite sex friends. Essentially, it said that men tend to harbor sexual slash romantic feelings for female friends, but what's more, they project that onto the women in their lives and believe that attraction is returned. Women in this study, on the other hand, were not romantically or sexually keen on their male friends. They felt platonically for them, you know, like a friend, and made the assumption their male friends also felt platonically in return. Obviously, the above does not apply to every man and woman out there, Women and men can just be friends. That said, I do think it is a reflection of quite a lot of men and women out there. I can't tell you how often I've befriended a man in the past only for him to blindside me and express feelings of attraction for me, often in creepy ways. I would be thinking that they were a nice guy, able to view women as people rather than a prize they want to obtain. Unfortunately, I have often been wrong and they were essentially playing a long game. The behavior that OP's boyfriend is displaying is concerning. He doesn't see his own hypocrisy, but worse still is that he ignores the fact that this clearly bothers her. I would not be able to trust him if I were in her shoes. I think you hit the nail on the head. It is time to leave. And now onto the update. He saw it. He's calling me, texting me nonstop. Should I take my time or answer it? Update 2, we talked. He fumed, like I expected. He said, I told you about that picture. Why did you post it? And what's with the caption? What are you trying to hint here? I replied with, wait, you don't like it? I thought it was a good caption. You seem to like it on Lexi's post, though. And he said, that's not the same? And I said, oh, it's not? We talked about this, and you clearly said that you won't do that again, but here we are. So he said, take the picture down. And I said, it sucks, yeah? You can like naked friends of yours, but I can't post for my friends? Bottom line, he's upset. Things are heated at the moment. I don't know if I messed up things by this, but I'm sure he did understand me clearly. Should I wait for him to contact me again or delete the picture? Update three, I didn't delete the picture. It's still up. He's trying to explain, but just comes back to the lines of, it's not the same. He apologized and said I've made my point clear. He said he's going to do his best to be better, and he'll respect my boundaries. Well, he did ask what has gotten into me, because I normally wouldn't react like this. I told him I said it in the past, but you still went ahead and did the same. I was bound to blow up after this. After all, I'm a human too. Bottom line, he apologized. I still didn't take the post down though. Lesson learned, I'll take it down now. Maybe in a while. Most probably the last update. To everyone who sent me all the supportive messages and kind words, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know there were many people who didn't support my actions, but I've reached a point in life where I'm done playing nice. I've been walked on my whole life. I wanted to stand up for myself and prove a point. Did it work? I guess. Do I regret this? No. I know taking the high road would have been better, but believe me, I've taken the high road so many times now that I was bound to fall a little. I know it was a petty move, but it proved my point. Will this relationship last? I don't know. Time will tell. But this just made me more confident. And to the ones asking me for the link to the post in my personal messages, I'm not going to give a link. To the boys who are personally DMing me, calling me a tramp, and stuff like insecure toxic GF, I honestly don't care, so don't bother DMing me stuff like that. I don't have to explain myself or my actions to you little boys. P.S. I know no one asked, but I'm turning 24 in 6 days. I'm looking forward to celebrating my birthday, and it'll be new beginnings for me. In the comments, quote, lessons learned, I'll take it down now, maybe in a while. This made me laugh hard. Lesson learned would be to dump the guy. You're 24. You don't need a boyfriend who not only stares at other women, but cares so little for you that he would make it publicly known he's thirsty and ignores your concerns. Not just stares at other women, stares after he's been asked to cut it out. 
I don't use Instagram, but why does he need to like the image instead of just looking at it? Would anyone even know if he had just looked at it but didn't like? I think the motivation is letting the poster know that you saw the picture and liked what you saw. I'll try to do better. Like what? Lol? How hard is it not to like a picture? He seems to be saying sorry only to get his way, not because he understands. This is indicated by him still saying it's not the same. Nah, he deliberately worded it that way so when he failed, he could say, What? I said I'd try. I would like to know how he thinks it's not the same without looking like a douche. I'm gonna bet he thinks his friend is fair game because she doesn't have a boyfriend, but OP can't do that because she belongs to him. I have a feeling it's the sort of guy who doesn't hear a woman's no, but does stop hitting on someone if she says she's in a relationship. But he assured OP that she had a boyfriend. But yeah, he is totally that guy. I once had to lie to a guy that I was married to get him to leave me alone. I told him to leave me alone, and he did not. I told him I had a boyfriend, which I do, but that didn't count. The moment that I said I was married, he got super mad that I had led him on. Unex post is titled, Am I the asshole for failing 27 out of 31 students for not taking a quiz? I teach a math class in eighth grade. Because the classroom is really small and there are many people, they sometimes are a bit loud. But that's okay, and I try to give my best to accommodate them to be the most comfortable. On Wednesday, they were really loud, and I announced an online quiz because we did not come to the point to do it in class. I also stated that I would upload it on Thursday, and it would be due on Friday at 6pm. It's not much, just 10 questions, just to see where everyone's at, but it is graded. I repeated myself twice that it was mandatory and graded, and they didn't listen apparently. I uploaded the quiz and four people actually took it. They received feedback and their grade. The rest did not take the quiz, so I gave them all a zero today. In less than 15 minutes, the first student emailed me saying that I could not just fail him. A few students joined in complaining about the zero, and some of them apologized for not turning it in. Then a mother emailed me asking me how I could fail her precious daughter, and that if 27 people failed, it would mean my quiz was too hard, and I would be an asshole to fail them all. Until now, I didn't respond to any of these emails, because then they would expect to answer everybody. I'll do this on Monday. But I'm wondering if I'm an asshole for failing them. For information, it's around 1% of their grade. Edit because I realized I need to clarify something, they were loud the entire period. Normally this is not the case. I don't know what was different this day. This caused us to be slower than I planned, and not being able to test where everybody stood on the topic. So at the end of the lesson, I told them that this quiz was being uploaded, and they have to take it. They were not especially loud then, but some were distracted with packing their things and stuff. Edit 2 because someone said that it was important, it was written on the board. It was written in the class book. There's all this stuff written down in terms of tasks and topics from their classes. In the comments, Teacher here, let the zero stand or you're teaching them that refusing to work and then complaining about it is acceptable. Give them an in-class assignment that is one, basically the same thing, and two, worth enough points that it brings up their averages. You could even give them the exact same thing and the kids who did it the first time get a double benefit since they already got the points and the feedback. Not the asshole. They're in school to learn more than math. This is a teachable moment. That sounds like a good way to approach the situation. Not the asshole. They need to learn to listen in class. Honestly, I couldn't even be mad as a student. Yeah, I would be disappointed that my grade is down by a point or two, but ultimately, it's my fault. Absolutely. This is a great lesson that barely affects their overall grade. I would make sure in my email I said, there was a mandatory quiz that every student had to take online on Wednesday evening. It was a total of 10 questions and is worth about 1% of their grade. Your child did not take this mandatory quiz, so they received a zero. Please note that I announced the mandatory quiz in class twice. I also had a notice on the chalkboard about the quiz. It was also shown as an assignment online. Finally, there is a notice about the mandatory quiz in the syllabus. 
Many children missed this test because they were not paying attention in class. The info about the test was on the board at the front of class where I was teaching and online. In the future, please ensure that your children check online each day so that they don't miss any assignments. It's the weekend. Feel free to ignore all parents' emails until Monday after school. You are not required to be available to parents 24-7. And when you do reply that our kid didn't fail because it was too hard, nor did the other students, they failed for not doing it at all. And now, on to the update. I just got another email from the same mother about why I didn't reply to her email since she wrote the first email a few hours ago. God, I love parents. Last edit, because I cannot answer every single comment, thank you all for your judgments. While there were many helpful and respectful comments with constructive feedback, I'm really shocked that people insult me as a person for an action that I post here. I do not talk about the you're the asshole judgments as I take them. I talk about the ones telling me I'm a horrid person, a bad teacher, or even insinuating that I'm mentally sick, via comments and via private messages. Maybe think before insulting someone for one single action without knowing what else happens in my classes and life. Now to the quiz. They know how to do it. They did it often before. They won't fail the whole class because of it. Also, I'm not responsible for telling their parents to remind them of a quiz. They are old enough to remind themselves. Many suggested that they could retake the test, and they can, but not for full credit and not in class. I will tell them on Monday, and it'll be due Wednesday morning at 8am, also online. As it is a simple 10 question multiple choice test, you can do it in 10 minutes on your phone, and that's more than enough time. Also, an update in the mother mailing me twice. I got an email from her daughter telling me how sorry she was that her mum messaged me as she panicked as her mum saw the zero and told her the quiz was too hard because she forgot about the quiz and therefore did not take it. Edit, the insults continue and so does the teaching advice from some people here. Again, in private and in this post. To make it clear to you, I accept every single you're the asshole statement as everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But I do not need your advice on classroom management, my teaching skills, or my personality for asking a judgement of one specific situation. The situation is this one quiz, not my general teaching because you don't know my teaching style as you only got told this one single situation. Also, yes, I got it. This post has language errors. Surprise, I am not a native English speaker as I stated before. Update, the kids came to me this morning and apologized. They all promised to take the test as soon as they got home today. A few whined when I told them that they get a different test with less credit, but most accepted it without discussion. In the comments, this is why I will never, ever, ever be a teacher. The kids are fine, it's the parents I wouldn't be able to handle. I've been a teacher for 10 years and recently left the classroom. The parents were horrible. Teenagers I can take, their parents not so much. I could fill a book with all the crap I got. It's gotten worse since emails became a regular thing. They somehow felt entitled to every hour of my day. The amount of emails I got complaining I hadn't answered their 11pm email was astonishing. I'm so glad that I left that world. I earn a lot less now, as teachers in my country actually make a decent-ish wage, but I've not cried once about work and actually look forward to starting my weeks now. No more Sunday dreads. I'm so tired of people, like the mother, thinking they're entitled to an instant reply. It was not an emergency, she could wait until Monday. I bet she doesn't respond back to people at work on her weekends. 24 to 48 hours is a normal response time. The other day, I was on the bus, and a bunch of kids getting off school boarded it. They started getting extremely rowdy, and after the bus driver tried to get them to calm the duck down, a teacher from their school also got on the bus to try to control them. She couldn't. One of her students even spat on me for the shits and giggles. She was so tired when the students left the bus, and that's why I immediately turn my face when someone mentions being a teacher. It's worse than working with customer service. For that, I admire them a lot too. OP has a lot of patience. I could never. As a teacher, I felt this post so much. 
I've had exact scenarios like this. What do you mean there was homework? You never said. Well, I did, but you were too busy talking. It was also written on the board. What do you mean there's a test? We've only had one day to review. That's because, again, you were too busy talking and wasted the two in-day review classes that I planned. And the date of the test has been on the board for over a week. We bombed the test because you only gave us one night to review. You had the study guide for an entire weekend, plus two in-class review days. It's not my fault you kept talking and only got the answers written down in a rush instead of letting me teach you. As a bonus, what do you mean I'm not allowed to do other classwork in your class? You're just reviewing and I know this stuff. Q shocked Pikachu face when they get a D. Am I the asshole for telling my fiance that if her cousin gets married on our wedding day, that they won't be welcome at our wedding? My fiance Nicole and I have chosen our wedding date, booked the venue, and notified the immediate members of the family of the date and the pending save the date mailings. Nicole's cousin Amber found out that we had announced the date and called Nicole upset that we had booked a wedding on her wedding date. We were confused because Amber and her boyfriend weren't even engaged, but she and her boyfriend claimed that they knew that that was the date that they were getting married. They were going to do a courthouse wedding with their families and then wanted to come to our wedding. I told everyone I wasn't comfortable with that because Amber's side of the family are completely self-centered and I didn't want them trying to take over our wedding and reception. I stood my ground and told Amber and her boyfriend that if they got married on our wedding day, they wouldn't be welcome. And I'd let the planner and venue staff know that they would be turned away. And I'd be willing to hire extra staff to make sure that they were refused entry. We also found out that the boyfriend lost his job, which just cements my thoughts that they were trying to get a free reception out of me and my fiance. Nicole is upset with me because they are family, but I'm just tired of Amber and her boyfriend trying to make every situation about themselves, now including our wedding. So am I the asshole? Edited to fix paragraphs, and no, not getting married on Halloween. Edit two, my fiance doesn't want to share the wedding slash reception for those assuming she wants to. She just doesn't want to deal with the familial fight that will break out between her side of the family and Amber's side of the family. Her parents are paying half, I'm paying one quarter, and my parents are paying one quarter. We're not getting married on a weekday. The city Amber lives in has Saturday hours for the JP courts for weddings. In the comments, not the asshole. Totally sounds like they're wanting a free reception, steals a spotlight, but with none of the monetary obligations. Not the asshole. The cousin is a major asshole for choosing to book a wedding knowing that her own cousin was getting married that day. Whoever books first is right in this situation. You booked first, and she's horrible for choosing the same day. She had 364 other days to choose from. Don't feel bad, you are 100% right. Not the asshole. They are not even engaged, which makes it highly suspicious. Not the asshole. they're definitely looking to use your reception. Beware though, because they'll probably still try it even if they change their wedding date. Why not just leave them off the guest list entirely? OP says, Oh, if I could do that, I would. But she refused to tell the rest of the family the crap they are trying to pull. And if we uninvite them, she'll have to explain why. Well, that kind of sounds like it should be their problem, not yours. You aren't doing anything other than defending your wedding day. If they end up looking bad, they did it to themselves. Any family drama that this does is entirely their fault. OP says, I agree, but she's stressed enough already, so I'm leaving it in her cousin's hands, and if they go ahead, they're out. You need to stress to your girlfriend that this is not just her wedding. Imagine how confused your side of the family would be. This is also the most trashy thing that I've heard lately, and they need to be uninvited. Who would even want to go to someone else's wedding right after their own? Her only reason is to preempt yours. Just rescind the invitation. Are you going to dread your wedding for the next few months because you're afraid they'll show up and ruin it? Instead of excitement, now the whole day is fraught with worry. Why do that to yourselves? Tell the rest of the family and let them shame Amber. You have done nothing wrong. Amber ruined a time of joy. Solve this immediately by uninviting her. Not the asshole. Oh, this is priceless. 
So Amber and her boyfriend decided, without telling anyone or being engaged, that they were going to get married on the exact same day that you chose, and when she found out about this unfortunate wedding clash, she phoned your DF with the boo-hoo-hoos about how you've stolen her most special date and how she has the sads. But wait, she has a great idea to rescue the situation. She'll get married in the courthouse and then invite all of her guests to your wedding, where they can eat all your food, sit at your tables, do their speeches, and probably push you and your DF over a bit so they can sit at the head table. The fact that by doing so, she gets a free reception on your dime never crossed her mind, of course. Is she planning on coming to your honeymoon too? This cheeky princess is trying to get a free wedding at your expense. Of course, she didn't want that date, she just saw an opportunity to steal your and Nicole's wedding, and so she's laying on the guilt to try to force you into it. Tell her to do one, and go pay for her own wedding. And OP replies, Pretty spot on, except for their guests. But I wouldn't put it past them to try it at the last minute. And now, on to the update. Happy news, everyone! The wedding went off this past weekend, and not only did my wife's cousin not get married on our wedding day, she dressed as a normal guest. She did, however, get drunk and pee in some bushes. No one in her family was surprised to hear about that. Well, everyone, a lot has happened in the last few weeks. Nicole's cousin and fiancé have announced their wedding date two weeks after ours. It came down to a comment I made in front of Nicole's twin sister, Brittany. Amber had announced their engagement and said that they were getting married in October, but no specific date. The three of us were chatting about things when Brittany brought up the announcement and mentioned how it seemed that they were trying to steal the spotlight again, and I muttered about them even stealing the wedding day. Nicole had said that she talked to Brittany about it, and she had, but she didn't tell her that they were doing it on the same day. Brittany lost her mind about it. She three-way called Amber and Amber's mom and read them the riot act. It was both glorious and extremely uncomfortable to listen to. There's a lot of stuff between those parts of the families. Brittany told them that they had a week to figure out when in October they were getting married, other than our wedding day, or she would tell everyone in the family what they were trying to do. Amber's mom tried to downplay it all, but Brittany wasn't having any of it. Even though she's about five minutes older than Nicole, she was acting like she was a much older protective sister. It was a long phone call, but in the end, they figured the jig was up. A few days later, they announced the date, but since Amber's fiancé lost his job and their families can't afford a traditional wedding, they're only inviting a small portion of their original guest list and having a Zoom wedding. Luckily, we don't get back from our honeymoon until the day after their wedding. Sharks. In the comments, Brittany is the MVP here. This is how you deal with people like that. Don't play dumb and think you're smarter than everyone. Brittany has dealt with that nonsense before. Pro boundary setter. Every family needs that one member who's willing to crack skulls. I don't think this was Brittany's first rodeo. No, every family and every group is trying to put that work on one individual, who then gets the rep of being the skullcracker, and occasionally becomes the scapegoat when families want to reconcile. It's everybody's job to set boundaries and put assholes in their places. I think both are true to an extent. My mom is a recovering doormat, and helping her discover and build her boundaries has been really important. But I still don't mind occasionally being the skullcracker in tricky situations. I just don't get how people have no shame. How do you even try to take over a wedding that's not even yours? That's just embarrassing. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for treating my adopted children the same as my biological children? Me, 44 male, and my wife Amy, 43, have a biological son Ethan, 16, and an adopted son Aiden, and daughter Gracie, 16 and 12. We adopted Aiden and Gracie 10 years ago. We've been talking about colleges for a while with the boys, and they both want to stay together wherever they go. We have college funds for all three children with the same amount in, so they will be able to afford to go if they decide to. My mother died and left me a lot of money, and I used it to fund their accounts, as I thought that this was more important than paying off our mortgage that we are comfortably paying each month. The more the boys talk about college, the more Amy gets upset with how much money it's going to cost. 
This all ended up in a huge argument between us, with her calling me an asshole. She apparently is happy to fund Ethan's college, but only part for Aiden and Gracie. I told her that this isn't fair, as they are all our kids, not just Ethan. He doesn't mean more just because he has our DNA. I told her it was my inheritance, and I can do what I want with it, and I wanted to make sure the kids had a good start to life. She said that she deserves stuff too, and me spending all the money on the kids means she doesn't get what she wants. She left a few days ago, and I haven't heard anything from her. I thought the kids didn't hear the fight, but today Aiden came down and said sorry for causing a fight between us, and that he's grateful that I stood up for him and Gracie. My heart went out for him, and I said that I will always stand up for him, and that I loved him and Gracie. He said I know, but I'm not sure about mum. So, am I the asshole? Should I compromise a bit to keep Amy happy? In the comments, not the asshole. Make sure the money is in funds that are tied directly to each child, and that your wife doesn't have access. You may even want to talk to a lawyer about how to make sure the money is not touchable in a divorce settlement, if it comes to that. I do not trust someone who could think and speak that way about children they have been raising for a decade. OP says, I will look into everything you have just said, thank you. I was thinking the same, in the event of divorce or death, do you have the money already secured for the children so she doesn't have access to any of it? Sorry, but the wife is untrustworthy. I could never do such a thing to my bio and stepchildren, never. OP says, all the money either is in the kids' names or mine. She has her own money in her own account. The money in your name might partially go to her in a divorce and in the event of your death, depending on your will and the inheritance laws in your area. She will absolutely be able to access the accounts that are in the children's names if you don't do anything to block that and you pass away. She may even be able to while you're alive, depending on how they're set up, since she is their legal guardian. You need to get a consultation with the family attorney right away. The kids' funds need to be secured with a different financial guardian named and a clause that specifies that she cannot access their accounts and that the funds should only be used for the children's education or a medical emergency for the child whose name is on the account. Do you have a sibling or a friend who is closer to you than to her who is financially reliable and could be the financial trustee for the kids? OP says, I have the money for the children in funds that only me or them can access at the moment, but I'll look into whether she can access it too, being their mother. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Not the asshole. It's absolutely horrible that your wife apparently thinks less of two of your kids because they're adopted. What was she like when the topic of adoption came up? Whose idea was it? OP says, the adoption was her idea. It was her family member who couldn't cope. I, at the time, didn't think we could afford all three of the kids, but they needed us, so we did it. And now she wants to cheap out so that she can have more stuff? That's gross AF. So your adopted children are her family. You're a good dad. I hope your wife comes around. OP says, yup, her cousin and his wife. Wow. And she has that kind of resentment toward them? That she'd deny the kids she wanted you to adopt as a couple because they were the biological children of her cousin and his wife. You're being a father in the best way possible to all of your children. I am so sorry you're having to go through this mess with your wife though. I'm sorry that Aiden and his sister have had such a cruelly harsh reality crash down on them about their mum because of her gluttonous greed for money and stuff. You are definitely not the asshole. And now, on to the update. I am putting this on here, but please still keep sending your opinions, as you may say something I haven't yet thought of. I will try and answer as many questions as I can. The adoption was her idea, as it was her cousin and his wife that were losing custody of the kids. Sadly, they are no longer with us and haven't contributed to their upbringing at all. I work full time and pay all the mortgage and bills. She works part time just for something to do. She keeps her money. This was agreed and is not an issue. I've explained in another comment this situation. The house is in my name as I inherited it from my grandfather. I took out a mortgage to remodel when we adopted the kids. All three kids are in therapy. 
Ethan doesn't necessarily need it, but he felt he was missing out on something, so he goes too. They have group and separate therapy, which was recommended to us. Amy left a few days ago. She is safe with her sister, but has not contacted us in any way. I hoped she would at least contact the kids, but no. I don't think I can be with her anymore, as I can't see how she can repair the relationship with the kids. I think her coming back now will be detrimental to their well-being, and it's something that I can't risk. In no way will I abandon Amy, though. I love her with all my heart, and if there is something going on that I don't know about, then she needs help and her family abandoning her is going to cause more harm than good. I'm willing to support her, but not be a couple at the moment. If it's just that she is greedy and selfish, then she can forget about having any kind of relationship with me. I guess I'll find out in the next few months. Also, I don't think of Ethan as my biological son and Aiden and Gracie as my adopted children. They are all my kids. Biological and adopted aren't words that I use day to day when describing my children. My post was worded this way to make it easier for people to understand. I thought this would have been obvious, but according to the messages I've been getting, apparently not. Thank you for all of your comments. I knew I was in the right, but sometimes you just need a stranger to say it and point out some things that you have missed. Update. Amy asked me to meet her without the kids, so I did. She said she was sorry about trying to get the money spent on her. I explained that we could do all the stuff she wanted to do within reason, just not out of their funds. She admitted that she was wrong and that I'm not an asshole. However, she doesn't want any help from me. She's aware that she has issues, but wouldn't tell me what. I said that I would do anything that she needs, but she wasn't interested. She did say that she hates that Ethan is so close to Aiden, and it was ruining her child. Obviously, I will never tell either of the boys that, and it did prove to me that Aiden and Gracie may be her problem. She's moving to Canada to live with her mom. I don't care what she gets up to up there. She didn't want to have any more contact with the children, didn't even want to say goodbye, so I let her go. In the comments, ruining her child. Wow. The child that she's apparently willing to abandon without a single word or second thought while she screws off to another country entirely. I know this sounds nuts, but I'm kind of hoping it's drugs and not just her finally revealing that she really is this awful in her clean and sober, grade A natural form. Or maybe she was cheating and the guy she fell in love with doesn't want kids. Looking at you, Diane Downs. Cheating was my thought. She may have been trying to get a large gift before leaving. It's not outside of reality for partners to sometimes ask for paid off cars to only drive off with a new person after selling the car for cash. I literally watched this happen to someone in my family not too long ago. His wife drove off in their new car paid for by him and his family, to go be with her ex. So the adopted kids are actually related to Amy, and it was her idea to adopt them, but now she hates them because the boys are close? Does she have a brain shimmer or something? There is no reason here. OP is a good man. I'm wondering if Amy has frustrations with the adult cousins and whatever was going on with them that led to being unable to care for the kids, and she is transposing those feelings about the adults to the kids. If the adult cousins are no longer with us, was it drugs? Crime? Does she think the kids will turn out like their birth parents? Is that what she means by ruining? Sounds like Amy needs therapy pronto. I wonder if Amy adopted the kids because she wanted love and praise from her family and friends, but once that wore off, she realized she wasn't cut out for being the mother of three, and or she is one of those people who can only love their bio child. OP and the kids are lucky to be rid of her so easily. Goes from talking to husband and admitting that she has a problem, to moving away without saying goodbye to the children she's raised for a decade and a half. Something's not adding up here. It could be any number of things, obviously, but the one that came immediately to my mind for me was addiction. I've known several people who have had this kind of weird pattern when in the throes of addiction, whether substance or gambling. Unex post is titled, I cheated on my wife three years ago. She agreed to forgive me if we opened the marriage, but now I live in agony every day. So basically, my wife, 39, found out that I, 41, have been hooking up with a woman that I met online who lived two hours away. 
When the woman visited, we checked into a hotel. This went on for three months and we had met a handful of times when my wife caught us. She was waiting in the hotel lobby and saw us coming down from the room. She left me the next day. We separated for eight months and they were terrible on all of us, especially the children, male nine, female seven, and female three. We started talking about getting back together. My wife thought that since our sex life wasn't enough for me and that she was sure that I would cheat on her again, we might as well open the marriage. I told her no because I've learned my mistake, but she wouldn't waver. I relented. We decided, or she did, not to tell each other the when, where, and with whom. Now, over two years later, we are back to normal on the outside. On the inside, I'm dying a little each day. Every time I see her happy, I wonder if this is just her old bubbly self or if she was thinking of someone. She is a very beautiful woman and I'm sure she has no problems finding men who want her. Whenever she takes a shower after coming home, whenever she rejects my advances, I think that she's been with someone and that kills me. I've tried to discuss closing the marriage again, but she shuts these attempts down very quickly with the divorce card. Before all this happened, we had amazing sex several times a week, but now we've probably done it four to five times these past three years. She demands I use protection and she refuses to let me eat her or make her come in any way. I stopped asking because the sex is painfully bad now. I haven't slept with anybody else because the look on my wife's face in that lobby still makes me sick with guilt. I don't know how much more I can take. I love my wife and I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Will she ever stop punishing me? Have you ever forgiven a cheating spouse and stopped punishing them? What's going on in her head? In the comments, My guy, you did this to your marriage. You said you had an amazing sex life but still cheated. You loved your wife and still cheated. Let her live her life the same way you decided that you were going to have an affair. Or leave and let her live her life. She was beautiful and they had amazing sex, but he still cheated. He's a piece of crap and deserves feeling like it. I have no mercy for cheaters. And says he cheated three years ago and has a three-year-old. F-U-O-P. Cheating on pregnant wife, a tale as old as time. Shake my head. It was over the moment you cheated. And her wanting an open marriage means it's 100% over, she just doesn't want the divorce legal issues. What's going on in her head, you ask, OP? Here's my guess. He betrayed me. I don't love him anymore. I will tolerate him for as long as I can, hopefully until the youngest graduates high school. My kids deserve stability, not splitting time between two crappy apartments, possibly losing friends, possibly changing to an inferior school district, and they certainly don't deserve the random women my husband, with his poor judgment, would inflict on them as stepmom wannabes. And I certainly don't deserve to have my standard of living decline through divorce. I played by the rules, was loving and faithful. I didn't sign up to be a single parent of three for 50 to 75 to 90% of the next 15 years. It grosses me out to be intimate with my husband at all now, but I can do a handful of times a year if that keeps him from being such a sad sack around me and the kids. It's weird how once I caught him cheating, he just doesn't find other women so excited. Oh well, not my problem. And now, on to the update. Thank you everybody for the reality check. The general consensus that I gathered from the comments, I never thought that there would be so many as I'm still reading them, is that you believe that my wife doesn't love me anymore. It's probably the truth. She's staying with me for the children, and I fully understand her. I love my children too, and I want to be in their lives all the time, every day. We have worked so hard for the beautiful life we have, and we did it all primarily for the sake of our children. I will not ruin that now for selfish reasons. I've decided to stop hoping, wanting, demanding love and forgiveness from her. Instead, I will accept that I will always live with this guilt. That's only fair. I will enjoy the other aspects of our marriage, like raising our beautiful children with an amazing person like her, and watching them grow up to be the good human beings they are. I will always love my wife, and I will always regret what I have done, but I need to move on too. 
I'm going to seek help for my mental health and probably start seeing other people too, when or if I'm ready. In the comments, it might be a good idea to broach this with her. Is an open relationship the best thing for your family? Or should you go separate ways and co-parent amicably? A marriage without love leaves you open to resentment and that can only be contained for so long. Don't assume that your children won't feel or be aware of this resentment. You are modeling what a romantic relationship looks like to them. It's a big responsibility. Just one thing, the kids will feel the tension but won't understand it. I've been here and I was crying myself to sleep at night for my parents to get separated because I hated to live with them because I knew they hated each other. I was eight. Don't make the same mistake. Divorced parents are always better for kids than married parents who hate each other. She only did the open marriage because she couldn't trust you to keep it in your pants. You've proven yourself to be untrustworthy. Like others have said, get over the woe is me and work on yourself instead of wallowing and choosing to take advantage of the open marriage. Try to actually talk about your feelings with her and find out if there is any reason to be together. You two can still co-parent without carrying a facade of a relationship. A healthy co-parent setup is better than a suffering relationship. God, that was hard to read. I'm trying to wrap my head around why a guy who had a beautiful wife that he had amazing sex with several times a week would want to cheat. Anyone can get cheated on. You can be hot, smart, kind, have a banging body, and still get cheated on. Absolutely because it was never really about their partner. The cheater is struggling psychologically with something, usually some insecurity they have. If Beyonce got cheated on, it can happen to anyone. All disrespect to Jay-Z, but him looking like that cheating on Beyonce solidified for me that no one is safe from infidelity. Maybe it's having your favorite food every day, but then someone offers you 2 a.m. Taco Bell. No way Taco Bell is better, but it's something new and slightly risky. Prove to me without a doubt cheating is 100% on the cheater if even supermodels and dream girls have unfaithful partners. Jesus, these people should divorce for the sake of their children. Yep, my parents didn't fight much, but I never saw them kiss or hug once. I didn't realize the damage of that until way later because I thought that's what all parents are like. And that's where I'm going to end today's episode, guys. I do hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. I found out that I'm the other woman. Should I tell the wife? A few days ago, I found out that a guy that I used to date last winter had given me a fake last name, got married in early spring, and had been engaged living with his fiance the entire time that we were dating, and as we continued to hook up every now and then in the months following us no longer dating. He was able to hide his wife from me in a variety of ways that all added up to be a perfect scenario for him to continue to lead me on and without me seeing a reason to ask many questions. For example, he was a coach and had weird work hours, like very early mornings and evenings after normal work hours. So many of our dates were lunch dates. He was also going through a messy custody hearing for his son that was scheduled for March 2022, so when he started to be busy a lot, I understood and didn't ask questions. He had told me that he didn't have social media to avoid giving his ex any fuel at all for the hearing. So when I couldn't find him online, well, he'd already told me why. At the time, there was no solid reason for me to distrust him, even if things sometimes felt a little off in my gut. At one point, I did question his interest in me when he didn't reply for a few days, and he told me, sorry, busy weekend with my son. He would reassure me and apologize, so he had many chances to set me free, even without coming clean. He could have just said, yeah, I'm not feeling it anymore, I wish you the best. And I feel so stupid for thinking what a great father he was for being so focused on his son when he had his weekends with him. He eventually was honest with me as the custody hearing got closer and told me that he needed to be focused on that and that he couldn't give me what I deserved in a relationship right now. When we stopped seeing each other regularly, we stayed in contact and occasionally slept together since we were both single, or so I thought. I even looked back through my calendar and we saw each other two days after his wedding weekend. Ick. I found out that he was married when I mentioned him at a business and someone who worked there said they think that he was their coach. 
I'm purposefully keeping that vague because when I confronted him, he tried to get me to tell him who it was that he coached who told me. I wasn't going to play that game. So, we looked up his coaching profile to see if we were talking about the same person, and there he was, smiling with a different last name than what he had told me 10 months ago, with the description saying that he likes to spend time with his wife, his son, and dog, same name that he told me. More Googling at home brought up a wedding registry for a wedding in April 2022. Both of their Facebook profiles were there in each other's pictures, and the house that he lives in with the wife's name is the owner. I feel so disgusted, deceived, targeted, hurt, mad, sad, shocked. So, ladies and supporters of ladies, do I tell the wife? Part of me wants to so that she isn't also being deceived by this guy and so he doesn't get away with it. But I also want it just to be done with, move on, and never think about him again. I'm afraid to open a door that I can't close by involving myself more into his twisted life. I'm slightly concerned about his reaction if I tell him, like my own safety or that of my property since he knows where I live, or if there's any other ways that a cruel and cunning person would get revenge that I'm not thinking of. Any advice or similar experiences? Thank you. Now in the comments. When I was married, I got a phone call from the husband of the woman that my husband cheated on me with. It was a hard call, but I'm grateful he did that. I had a lot of little signs, but his call and the proof of my husband's infidelity that his call led me to find, like phone records, ultimately helped me end a terrible marriage. F, yes. As someone who has been the wife, tell her and tell her right now. I'll second the yes. Do you know why he's having a custody hearing for his son? Could this have maybe been that he is a serial cheater and he has cheated on a former partner or cheated with the mother of his son? Just my thoughts when I hear a situation like this. OP replies, he told me they broke up because she's changed a lot. He didn't use such neutral wording and became abusive and he worked too much and wasn't around enough for her and their son. I have no idea how much of this is true. He told me a lot about the ex that made her seem very irrational and angry, but I feel like guys like him tend to like to make themselves the victims too, so who knows what she's really like. Two days after their wedding weekend, give that woman every last scrap of evidence that you have of his infidelity. Get your transcripts from your mobile service, get the texts and send them to her. If you feel like that's too much work, Think about if the situations were reversed and he was your husband. Would you want her to do right by you? Let that thought drive you. He is real scum. You didn't deserve that and the wife especially didn't deserve that. Yes, 100%. Although this probably goes without saying, be kind. This poor woman is going to be devastated. I'm so sorry this happened to you both. I would tell her, but only anonymously. I was in a situation where I found out a guy I dated was married and I immediately ended it and sent all screenshots to his wife. But she ended up blaming me and then stalked me for a year. The whole thing stopped when she banged on my door at 3 a.m. thinking that he was with me as he kept on cheating on her. So I think she moved on to keeping tabs on the new girl that he was dating. Seconding this. Tell her and give her enough details so she knows it's not just gossip, but stay anonymous. Not everyone will be grateful. OP asks, any ideas for staying anonymous? I only know how to reach her through Facebook or LinkedIn. I could maybe do a fake Facebook profile with a fake email. A lot of these ideas are so in depth. Don't lie to her or get a burner phone or send a letter. All you need to do is look into privacy settings on Facebook and make sure your info isn't accessible for people you aren't friends with. I'm sure there are settings that you can set up where you can contact her without being able to see any other info than your first name. And don't lie to her about being someone else. She's not going to believe anything you say if she finds out that you lied about anything you tell her. Tell her the truth and 100% include that you did not know that he was involved with anyone else at all. Good luck and so sorry you're going through this weird situation. And now on to the update. After protecting myself and my identity in what ways I could, I told the wife. 
I found her number and texted her a brief, factual message that her husband cheated on her, the date we matched on Bumble, how I had no idea he was engaged or married, the fake last name and how he never mentioned her, but did mention other people in his life. I gave her a few screenshots to demonstrate that it went on over a series of months. She replied the next day, thanking me. She said she was on her way to her parents' house and was planning on filing for a divorce as soon as possible. She had been suspicious after testing positive for HPV about a month ago. As I and you guys suspected from the house being only in her name, apparently he is completely financially dependent on her and everything he told me about having investments and small businesses is a lie. I also found out that in addition to a fake last name, he gave me a fake phone number too. She cautioned that he may try to retaliate once she gives him the news, and she will message me before she gives him the papers so that I can go to a friend's house for a few days if I feel the need. It's been a stressful and emotional past few days. I'm upset that men like this exist. Proud of myself for telling her. Thankful to my friends and to all of you who encouraged me to tell her. Proud of her for leaving him. A little bit scared of what he will do. In the comments, I'm glad she's giving you the updates along the way so you can protect yourself. Sorry you have to go through this and happy that you're on the other side now. Sweet baby Jeebus, I'm so, so overjoyed to see two women taking care of each other instead of one placing blame on another who tried to do the right thing. You two are a wonderful example. Love this. I found two best overseas best friends this way. Found out my boyfriend had cheated on me with a plethora of girls. A few overseas who obviously didn't know him day to day. I legit created a group chat and added like 12 to 15 girls and explained I had an engagement ring on and we'd been together for just over a year after one of them messaged me genuinely terrified that I would be fuming with her. I'd left him, but didn't want them getting hurt. Not one of us was pissed at the other. A few just moved on, but I ended up with two American besties who even helped me cultivate the last few messages I sent him with facts from them to prove his cheating. Not one of them knew about me. I can't be pissed at them for that. It's always a huge risk telling the partner who has been cheated on the truth since you never know how they'll take it. But damn if she isn't a class act. I hope she'll be okay and that you will too. So true. I once told a woman that her partner was cheating on her as he had flirted with me and made out with me at a bar and when I looked up his name on social media, I saw he was living with a woman. I told her and she called me a liar, jealous, a tramp and accused me of trying to break them up and then blocked me. I'm glad the woman in OP's post was understanding and left the guy.